Well, I think we'll get started. <clears throat> this is Linda Meshke again with Rural Advantage. Lois Brown is going to be our host, but she's busy answering a question right now. So I, I think I'll um, just get us started. And uh, Jason Fishbach is here with the University of Wisconsin Extension. And he's going to tell us about the hazelnut grower clusters that are um, have formed around our region. So Jason, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Just a quick sound check. Linda, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes. All right, here we go. So welcome everyone to day two of the conference. Uh, I wanted the full conference experience. So I stayed up last night till 2 a.m. watching TV. And then I had uh, my kids slam the doors in the hallway at like 5.30. Uh, and then I got up and I had some Fruit Loops with skim milk in a styrofoam bowl. So I'm feeling good, ready for a conference. Uh, what I was going to talk about today is the work that's underway here in the Midwest to form grower clusters. And more than that, it's an effort to do to be a bit more strategic in how we develop the industry in the upper Midwest, uh, recognizing that in, off, in many cases, new crops suffer from a boom and bust cycle, or they just sputter and never get off the ground because they're not effective in developing markets or whatever reason. So we're trying to be intentional here. Uh, I kind of think of it as hazelnuts 2.0 for the upper Midwest in terms of how we're gonna go about launching in this, and growing this industry. So I just wanted to share some information with everybody about uh, what we're doing, both for those of you obviously that are in the Midwest and we want you, or the upper Midwest, want you to get involved with these clusters. And those of you from other regions, maybe you'll learn something or about what we're doing can apply to your region, or hopefully we can learn from you too, what, what you're all doing. Um, so we are very much now in the scale-up phase in the upper Midwest. We feel as though we have uh, uh, plant material that's suitable. Uh, we feel like there's a breeding pipeline in place and that there's enough infrastructure developed now that we can feel more comfortable going ahead to scale up. Uh, and I'm not gonna talk about all these today, just the, the grower network process, but I just want you to be aware that this is part of a more comprehensive effort to, to stand up the industry, if you will. So we are launching uh, with some funding from the USDA, uh, what are we calling hazelnut grower clusters or grower networks. And we're starting with six initial networks and each of the networks is uh, coordinated by one of our partners. Uh, and right now we've initially launched with the Northwest Wisconsin cluster organized uh, by myself, the Center for Integrated Ag Systems in central Wisconsin uh, with Regina Hirsch, and then David Bruce at the Savannah Institute is coordinating a driftless cluster, which would include basically this region of the upper Midwest. Uh, and then Jeff Jensen, who you heard from yesterday with the Iowa Nut Growers Association is coordinating an Iowa cluster. And in Minnesota right now we have two uh, rural advantages in Linda, the Southern Minnesota and uh, Greg Schwesser in the, in the Northern section. Um, so we have cluster coordinators in place to provide leadership for these groups. And it's, um, I'm gonna talk about more specifically what we do here, but the idea is basically just to help growers get organized and work together to develop their supply chains, to develop their local markets and develop the infrastructure that they need to be successful. So I wanna just um, make sure everybody's uh, can put names to faces here. So I'm gonna to go to our website quickly and just show you the page that we've set up. If you go under, so this is midwesthazelnuts.org. You go to four growers and you'll see grower, grower networks. And the same picture I just showed, and we'll just scroll down. So here's myself with Northwest Wisconsin. You can see an email. Uh, and that's how you would get a hold of me if you live in Northwest Wisconsin. Now, what is exactly the geographic boundary of Northwest Wisconsin? These are all kind of uh, squishy boundaries. So uh, just find, find one that's nearest to you and we can kind of sort it out. There's David Bruce with the Driftless Grower Cluster uh, with the Savannah Institute, his email is there. And the Central Wisconsin Grower Cluster uh, is coordinated uh, by these three with the Center for Integrated Egg Systems uh, from left to right, Merle Ingram, Michelle Miller, and Regina Hirsch. And Regina is the, taking the primary lead at this point for that cluster. Uh, in Northern Minnesota, there's Greg, uh, and they have been doing quite a bit with some outreach education uh, with their growers and have an active listserv going. Um, one of these days, I'll get a picture from Linda to put up here, but she's coordinating the Southern Minnesota Grower Cluster. 
And then again, there's Jeff Jensen. So if you live somewhere in Minnesota, uh, Iowa, um, Wisconsin, and even Northern Illinois, I encourage you to contact your nearest grower cluster coordinator and get on their list. And that's gonna be the best way to keep up to date on activities that are developing or going on in your, in your region. Okay, we'll go back to the slides. Now, what, what would grower clusters do? Oops, just a second. Uh oh, phone's ringing at home, sorry. Okay, so what can grower clusters do? Um, grower meetings, right? Obviously, um, we are doing Zoom now. I hear in the past that there, in the olden days, you could get together in a room with strangers and do this kind of thing. Um, maybe someday in the future that'll happen again, but these are obviously... You know, in the world of outreach education, we call this developing communities of practice is the fancy term where basically you get growers working together and learning together, um, which I think is, is hugely important because uh, there's a lot, A, we don't know about hazelnuts and B, a lot we're learning as we go. And so staying up to date is important. Field days, uh, I think these will for sure return uh, in 2021, even if COVID is still with us because we've just figured out how to do this. Uh, so look for your coordinators to do field days this coming year. Uh, this is one that's slowly developing over time as the plant material is available, but trying to put in each of these grower clusters in these geographies, uh, locally relevant field trials, whether they're germplasm trials or agronomic trials of some sort. This is at the West Madison Research Station near Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, that's a, it's a germplasm trial evaluating some material. And for those of you that have contributed material, somewhere in here, you'll find the Beast and you'll find Grand Traverse and uh, the Grimo selections are in here as well. The little ones in the tubes, those are the UMHDI selections, which were later entries. And this spring, there will be uh, the landmark series from Rutgers will go into trials like this. So we've got uh, six of these established and the plan is to continue to, to, to get more of these so that each grower cluster has locally relevant research data as to uh, germplasm performance. This is, this is the most important slide I think you will see all day. Sorry to all the other presenters. But in order to build this industry, we have to have the capacity to harvest hazelnuts. And unless you have access to a low paid harvesting crew, uh, it, you can't harvest uh, by hand. And that's been a bottleneck for a while. And these harvesting units, even old cheap ones that you can find are still expensive. And without sufficient acreage to support them financially, you really need to work with your neighbors. You need to work with folks that you can share the harvesters. And yes, you can put these on trailers, but ideally you're uh, located close enough that it's financially practical to move these uh, harvesters from farm to farm. Now, there may be a day in the future where each of our plantings are large enough to support a harvester unit itself, but these are pretty big over the top straddle harvesters that come with a substantial expense, maintenance expense, and it's just going to be a lot easier initially to share these than it is to buy your own. So I think this is an important reason for why these clusters exist and what they can do. Along those lines, uh, you know, establishing hazelnuts, it's sort of a, you know, you might do this couple of years in your life, right? And so why own equipment like this? Uh, this is an eco weeder that you can use. And so I think there's opportunities by working together to share equipment. Always hard to do to share uh, equipment, but it might just be a case where you've got an entity that owns it and manage it. Maybe it's a cooperative of some kind, or maybe there's at least enough demand in a region that you can convince someone to run a weeding business as a contracted service and they can own and maintain the equipment. But again, all of that's easier if you've got growers working together. Same thing goes the dehusking and aggregation. Uh, you know, and if you look at anywhere that there's nut production in the world, you're going to see some aggregation happening at processing nodes of some kind, where they're doing some of the primary processing, whether that's drying or, or in the case of hazelnuts, most likely dehusking. So again, other reasons to share equipment and to uh, work together to pool volumes. And this is starting to happen in the Midwest already. The other one is pooling your buying power for plant material, negotiate with nurseries or even contract with nurseries to grow exactly what you want and the pot size that you want and when you want it, right? So if you're working together and you can place an order for 10,000 instead of 10, 
you're just going to have more power in the marketplace and nurseries are going to want to work with you more because they've got um, some certainty in terms of the uh, sales before they invest in, in, you know, the expense of growing out these plants. So that's also important to work together. So the other thing um, with respect to plant material, um, you know, private nurseries can sell wherever and to whomever they want, that's up to them. But what we're trying to do on the public side with, because some of this material will be patent protected uh, and also just because we can be more organized if working in, in, in cooperation with the grower community is being more intentional on how we make this plant material available. And I'll talk more about this in a second, but the idea here is that uh, the, you would access the plants coming from the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative through the grower clusters, and each cluster is being strategic about where those plants are going. Again, trying to get plantings closer together, trying to get plants in the hands of growers that are going to, you know, that have some experience or that are serious about growing hazelnuts. Um, you know, just growing hazelnuts for fun is great, but when plant material is limited in availability, uh, it's maybe not the highest and best use for that plant material. So at least initially uh, to access, in this case, the seedling material, but eventually the clonal material, you'll need to work through the grower clusters for the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative plant material. Again, the private nurseries or other nurseries are free to do this however they want, or breeders, I should say. Okay, so um, this is what I call Hazelnuts 1.0. And to Forest Ag's credit to the um, um, Badger set and to, um, uh, John a blank, folks in Nebraska, the, I'll remember it later. Uh, to their credit, they, you know, more or less launched the industry by getting seedlings in the hands of growers across the upper Midwest. But what happened is, you know, whatever seedlings they produced were sold to whomever and wherever they wanted to grow them. And so we wound up with this, right? Dots of, of growers all over the place, some with 10 plants, some with a thousand, some with 500 really not coordinated at all, not really, you know, everything was independent. And, um, and now we sort of, in some ways are, are dealing with that. And for example, now many of these plantings are mature and they're trying to sell their hazelnuts. And so we're aggregating hazelnuts with limited supplies from across, this was from 2020, where we got the nuts from the red dots. So we've got growers scattered all over the place and, and the processing facility is in Ashland and everything's inefficient. And we've got you know nuts going here and then back to here and we've got growers all over. What we'd like to see is a little bit more coordination in hazelnuts 2.0 in terms of how the plant material is, is put out there and thinking about okay how is it going to be harvested how is it going to be husked where is it going to be sold, and then try to try to develop around that. So this is what I mean by hazelnuts 2.0. This is sort of the ideal, and I think we can all work together toward this. So first would be like I'm talking about these clusters of interconnected growers within what I would say practical harvest sharing distance or harvester sharing distance. You know, what is economically feasible for hauling that harvester back and forth? Five miles for sure, 500 miles, probably not. So exactly what that geography is, we don't know, but we want growers when they're planting or, or grower clusters, when they're distributing plant material to be thinking about that harvesting component in the future. Um, we wanna see coordinated and participatory germplasm improvement um, I would like, you know, I, my hope is that we just send out seedlings nilly willy to anyone that wants to grow them. I hope those days are over. I would like anyone that's growing seedlings be, to be doing so for a purpose. And that would be evaluating that plant material, participating in, in a coordinated evaluation effort so that we can all work together to develop improved germplasm. Whether those are uh, progeny families or clones or whatever, but I think we should be more, more coordinated in how we do do this growing. And that might mean growers that are just doing this for fun don't have access to plant material initially, right? And I think that's okay because we're trying to grow this industry and solve a lot of problems with hazelnuts. Clearly we need pooled production volumes as we go uh, in order to access markets, in order to have a consistent and dependable kernel supply around which small and mid-scale buyers can build products, can grow markets, can get product to market, right? So uh, these two go hand in hand. Everybody going it alone on their own is, is just not going to be as effective. It certainly can happen, but there's got to be some pooling of volumes initially in order to have any sort of scale. Um, grower ownership of the value chain, you know, this is kind of a loaded, loaded statement, but I think it's important early on that 
there's value added to the hazelnuts because the cost of production are going to be a challenge at a small scale. And so if you can maximize top dollar for what you're selling, that's going to help the economics. It also ensures that the growers, uh, as you, we know in agriculture, this is always a struggle, who's capturing the, the largest portion of that retail dollar, and we hope growers get more. Uh, you know, Growers tend to always lose this fight, but we can at least try as we develop the hazelnut industry. I think hazelnuts 2.0 is also eyes wide open as to the risks of the potential of hazelnuts. I think in the past, and rightfully so, uh, the early proponents of hazelnuts really had to be salesmen and women at the same time to lay out the vision for hazelnuts and the potential. Uh, and sometimes the cold, hard reality of where we were at with germplasm and in industry kind of got glossed over. Um, but I think we're at a phase now that we get it, right? We know there is no silver bullet to our agricultural systems. We know that there's you know, no magic hazelnut plant out there. So everything comes with risks uh, and, and we just need to be eyes wide open to that and, and be realistic as we go to develop the industry. So I think that's an important component. And then, you know, we're trying to back, you know, hazelnuts 1.0, there was no public support for hazelnuts. And because hazelnuts have the potential to provide so much public good in terms of cleaner water, cleaner air, healthier food supply, uh, climate mitigation, all these, all these public goods, there's a good justification to be made that the public sector should be involved in subsidizing the early stage of the hazelnut industry, uh, specifically to reduce barriers to entry. And the two that are uh, developing most quickly here would be our hazelnut processing accelerator that I'll talk about later in the conference, and then uh, using the USDA equip funding to help bring down the cost of establishment. So, you know, these pieces are, are in place, uh, our industry, and I kind of look at these, and this is our last slide here, um, is we've, we're starting to get pieces of the industry together. So with these grower clusters, with the new plant material, I think we can have an orderly production of supply chains. And we've got some initial, you know, our pioneer plantings that are out there are, are seeding the, the whole industry, which is what makes possible, say, the American Hazelnut Company. But as new production comes online, we need to be strategic about it. Uh, we have processing capacity right now. Uh, it's not great, but it's matched to the scale of our uh, of production right now. And we have a path forward to grow that as, as, uh, as the production grows. And we have a grower-owned processing company that allows people to access markets if they don't want to do it on their own. We have an R&D program, the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative. It's uh, publicly funded, which is uh, you know, always a challenge to chase down grant money. Uh, but we also have some private support now through the Grantham Foundation. So that's encouraging. And you know, hazelnuts are an interesting new crop because it's not really a new crop in the market space, right? Hazelnuts is a global industry. And so there's plenty of buyers. We just have to provide what they want at the prices that they can pay versus a crop like Kernza, which probably many of you have heard of. It's a brand new crop, a brand new thing that they have to create markets from scratch in a lot of cases. Uh, in some ways it can just replace regular wheat, but it is it's, it's totally different. Who's heard of Kernza in the marketplace, right? So we do have that advantage if, if we, we have an existing crop, people know about it and we can sell it. The one piece that I, you know, we, we have not yet seen develop uh, in some ways, sort of the American Hazelnut Company is filling that role, but um, we don't have a Midwest Hazelnut Growers Association. Um, and maybe it's time for that to happen. But at the end of the day, growers have to want it and they want to uh, they're going to have to organize it and have a reason to do it. So we're kind of just letting them, you know, figure that part out. So uh, just in conclusion, I just want to point out again that these clusters are forming as a means not only to help educate and give growers some outreach education resources, but also as part of this overall strategy to grow uh, the industry. Thank you, Jason. So now I'm Lois Brown. I'm um, Jason's sidekick at the University of Minnesota. And um, I'm going to host today's session, which is uh, the research focus. I'm excited because we are going to have several young people who are either graduate students or recent grads or in two postdocs uh, presenting, and none of these people have presented before to this group. Uh, we will also have um, 
some old sidekicks, including myself and um, Mike Demchik from UW um, Stevens Point. Um, he's a forester and uh, Dave and Scott Sanford from um, who are the ag engineers working on um, processing uh, harvesting equipment and uh, Jerry Cohen, who is a professor in uh, plant sciences at the U of Minnesota. So we're gonna start with Haley Shanovich. Uh, Haley is a PhD student in natural resource science and management at the U of M in Dr. Brian Akima's lab. For her dissertation research, she is studying insect pests for, of hybrid hazelnuts and developing management recommendations for them. Her major professor, Brian Akima, is a professor of forest insect science, where he is thrilled to work with special talents like Haley on a variety of insect challenges to trees and shrubs across the region and beyond. So welcome, Haley. Thank you for the introduction, Lois. Um, I will start sharing my slides. So can everyone see my slides now? Yes, we can. Awesome. So good morning, everyone. I'm Haley, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, weevils, which I've heard is um, um, that a lot of you have been <laughs> experiencing and very familiar with as of late. So I'm glad that this is a relevant topic. So there are actually several species of hazelnut feeding weevils worldwide. Um, there are different species, um, so sorry, the nut weevil Curculio nucum is native to Europe and causes high yield losses in European hazelnut in Europe and Turkey. The filbert weevil Curculio occidentis causes um, inconsistent damage in Oregon on European hazelnut, so inconsistent that they don't really have a management plan for this weevil. And then finally, the hazelnut weevil, Curculio obtusus, which is native to North America and associated with our American hazelnut here, and um, has been observed to cause damage in our hybrid plantings throughout the Midwest. So this is the one I'll be focusing on today. This is the one, if you're in the Midwest or Eastern United States, that has been damaging your hazelnuts. So weevils are a type of beetle that have these really long trunks on them. And um, they also have club-like antennae, as you can see here. And then this particular weevil, the hazelnut weevil, has this kind of mottled brown tan coloration, and it can kind of have white markings on it as well. So these weevils, the adult females, are the ones who are feeding and laying eggs. Um, so the, this is what they look like up close under the microscope. And then here's one out in the wild. <laughs> so um, they do feed on the leaves and hang out in the crops before the hazelnuts are even developing and may feed on the hazelnuts as well as lay eggs in them. So then those eggs will hatch and the larvae will burrow into the kernel. They'll feed on the kernel throughout their whole development. So this is what they look like if you haven't seen them before. They're kind of maggot shaped grubs and they have kind of this red head on them. And they'll be growing in there and feeding throughout the whole season. Then um, as the hazelnuts approach maturity um, and are beginning to drop, the weevils, uh, the larvae will chew holes and um, exit the nuts, fall to the ground, burrow underneath the ground where they will pupate and then emerge as adults the following year. So we don't have management practices yet established in North America for hazelnut, for weevils, um, for hazelnut weevils. So current management for the nut weevil in European hazelnuts mainly just involves chemical control. They monitor for weevils from mid-April through June. And they do this by beating the upper part of the hazelnut plants um, from two adjacent rows, about six to 10 plants onto a cloth or a sheet of some kind. And then they just count the number of weevils that fall out. So then if they are seeing about two to three weevils per plant, they treat with pyrethroids. 
They reevaluate after two weeks, and if necessary, they treat again with pyrethroids. So we need to amend this for the Midwestern United States. So my work specifically is looking at when are the weevils um, in the plants, when are they laying eggs? Also, I want to explore other control options besides just pyrethroids. We're interested in um, determining what aspects of the plant or nut characteristics are the weevils most attracted to and which ones are they not, and try to help identify resistant cultivars of the hazelnuts. So my two objectives um, throughout my research here at the U of M are to develop a model for predicting um, when the adult weevils are in the crop, when are they laying eggs? Also to identify plant or hazelnut characteristics that attract or deter weevils. So for my research um, for the weevils, I currently work at two sites in Minnesota, St. Paul and Rosemont. And so this last summer, 2020 was my first field season and I sampled um, plants at our two hazelnut plantings weekly from late May through late July. We weren't sure when the weevils would show up exactly. I started seeing them in late July, and so I just started sampling then. Um, this next coming summer, I would like to start a little earlier to see if they're showing up um, even before late May. But we sampled five varieties at each of those locations and two plants of each variety. So this is just a visual of what the sampling looks like that we described um, for Europe. So you basically just beat the plant <laughs> onto a cloth. We did about 10 times, 10 um, strikes, and then counted the number of weevils. So we did this weekly on each plant. We also measured um, hazelnut phenology characteristics. So we were measuring the in-shell volume of the hazelnuts, the shell thickness of the hazelnuts, shell hardness, which is um, the force it takes to break through the hazelnut shells, and then the hazelnut cluster height and width. And we did this each week throughout the weevil um, monitoring season. We also didn't really have a baseline of how much damage are these weevils causing? What is the infestation levels? in the field, how many nuts are they actually um, infesting? So what we did is subsample 10 nuts from each plant at these two sites. Um, and what we, uh, then we just like had a baseline of infestation. And actually um, in this picture, this is kind of our hazelnut base camp we set up where we were processing the nuts as we go, cracking them open, counting the number of weevils in them. Um, and this person right here is Phelan Anderson, who is a technician in our lab. And um, he is now working on a spatial analysis with me of this data to see if, um, the within field distribution of weevils can be predicted. Do they follow kind of um, predictable spatial patterns within the field? And then also um, are things like nitrogen applications, yield of these different plants predicting the um, spatial infestation of these weevils. So we have some results to share with you from last summer. Basically, our infestation study showed that every fifth hazelnut had a weevil at our two sites, which is a lot more than I was expecting, actually. So in St. Paul, we had just over 21% of all the um, hazelnuts sampled were infested, and at Rosemont, just over 22%. So this shows me that this is definitely an area that we need to um, continue research and improving management practices for this weevil. So from my data, I was able to kind of um, look at what the life cycle of this weevil is in the upper Midwest. So we started sampling in May and we saw adult weevils all the way through about mid-July. So this is the time, at least for now that I have, so in 2020, this was when the adult weevils were, were present. We want to repeat the same study this next year to solidify those dates and then convert it to degree days so we can easily um, predict with degree days when the weevils are showing up. They start laying eggs we saw in um, uh, July, or sorry, June 11th. So kind of early to mid June is when we saw them start laying eggs in the hazelnuts. So then shortly after hatching, those larvae are going to be developing inside the hazelnut kernels all the way to about harvest. 
Then around harvest, the larvae will chew their exit hole, as you saw, and exit the nuts and burrow down into the soil where they will pupate. So like I said, we need to reconfirm um, all these dates and create a degree day model, but this is roughly the weevil's life cycle in the hazelnuts here. We also found um, that female weevils had a lot of eggs. After we collected weevils from the field, we would bring them into the lab, um, ID if they were males or females, and then dissect the females to see how many mature eggs they had inside. So the females had eggs uh, from June 11th all the way through July 23rd. Females on average had about 11 eggs, but this ranged from three eggs to 30 eggs, depending on the date. So peak egg production though we saw was between June 18th and July 8th. So this is really the danger region of time in which the weevils will be laying lots of eggs in the hazelnuts. Um, we need to confirm those dates for sure, but this is kind of the period you can expect. So this is just a drawing of where the weevils are laying their eggs. So they kind of drill a little hole and put the egg just um, at the edge of the shell. So not into the kernel, but kind of embedded in between here. We also found that not all hazelnut uh, cultivars were equally um, damaged, uh, or not all cultivars of hazelnuts had as many weevils in them. So the actual um, varieties here are not important for you to remember. I just wanted to show that um, some varieties had very low weevils at every collection date. So these are the varieties and these are the number of weevils collected um, on each date. And so some varieties had really low number of weevils and some had about up to five on each date, which is above that economic threshold of two to three for them to be injuring the plants. This is just from one location, um, but I just wanted to illustrate that. So in conclusion, we need more data. We need to repeat this study, solidify those um, dates, and um, yeah, just continue developing management plans for these weevils. So if you know that you have weevil infestations right now, I can suggest that you watch for weevils, especially in the middle of June. Um, if you decide to monitor like we did, if you've been having high infestation levels, you could consider a pyrethroid spray if you're seeing more than two weevils per plant. And then you could wait two weeks and if necessary, um, apply a second pyrethroid spray at the beginning of July. We hope to identify um, characteristics that are determining what cultivars the weevils are preferring so that we can um, proceed to identify these resistant cultivars and make those um, available to the public. So, um, However, the, these management guide, guidelines are in their infancy and um, there's lots of other avenues we want to look at as a team in the future. I know Lois had told me recently that she's going to be working with the grower to see if um, poultry within the orchards can help reduce the number of grubs in the soil and then subsequently weevils. I really want to also look at if landscaping fabric can prevent um, weevils from infesting the fields because what is, um, they usually fall kind of right where they come out of the hazelnuts. So if you have an infested plant, those weevils are probably dropping right there under the plants. And so that's something I would like to look at in the future as well. So with that, I would like to acknowledge um, my advisor, Dr. Brian Alkema, and everyone in his forest entomology lab at the university, um, my funding sources, my collaborators, um, people who let me use their equipment, our technicians, and then my contact information is provided here. You can always email me at my email if I don't get to your questions. So with that, I will take any questions. I'll stop screen sharing. So thank you very much, Haley. And I wanted to interject at one point, but I was afraid I would, um, <laughs> surprise Haley and set her off, but uh, the beautiful drawing that you saw of the weevil towards the beginning of her presentation was drawn by Haley. So uh, she's also an artist. Um, uh, when we first saw that, we thought it was a photograph, but it was a drawing.
<laughs> um, so questions. I've already answered some of them, but I should clarify. Um, several people have asked whether that was one in five nuts or one in five plants that had weevil infestation. And I believe that it's one in five nuts. Is that correct? Yes, that was correct. So we were taking a sample of 10 nuts from each plant and on average, every fifth hazelnut was infested with weevils. Okay. Um, do hazelnut weevils only infest hazelnuts or do they also infest other plants? They only infest hazelnuts. There are also weevil species that infest oak trees, for example, but those are not the ones you're seeing in your hazelnut. Okay. Um, do they release any pheromones that you know of? Not that I know of. That's a great question, Lois. So pheromones are this like chemical um, signal that insects can get off, give off to either attract insects to the plant, so they're same species to the plant, or tell them, hey, I've already marked this territory, this is mine. Um, and so not that we know of, that that definitely um, deserves some future re uh, research to see if they're doing that. Okay, so when they emerge from the soil, um, are they emerging as adults? And when, when do they emerge? Yeah, so they are emerging as adults and they're emerging in spring. They're emerging in May. Um, we don't know, I, I need to um, solidify that this summer with more research to see if they're, when in May they're emerging, but for sure they're already in the plants in late May, which means they emerged at that time or a little earlier than that. Okay, do you know how deep they burrow? Uh, yes, um, they only burrow a couple inches below the soil. So I would think that they're susceptible to frost. Um, I think I saw they can burrow up to six inches, so not very deep. Okay, um, any information about possible predatory insects? That's a very good question. There's really not a lot of previous research on this insect because it was just considered kind of a forest insect before we started planting um, hazelnut fields. So no one has really studied specific predators of it, but um, like a lot of insect predators are general generalists, meaning they feed on kind of any insect species. So certainly some of those generalist insect predators um, could be preying on the weevils. So things like um, praying mantises maybe, or um, maybe some things could be preying on the eggs even, um, like uh, I don't, I can't think of the names off the top of my head, but certainly um, beneficial insects and natural enemies are a good thing to have around. What about um, soil dwelling, things like uh, fungi that might um, attack the, the larva in the soil? Yeah, so no um, research has been done on that specifically for um, this species, but Certainly there are other grub species that um, I'm thinking of Japanese beetle off the top of my head, that there are um, predatory, that there are uh, fungi that feed on them and even bacterial diseases. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, those are usually really specific to the insect species. So like those ones that feed on Japanese beetles would not feed on the weevils. So that's something that deserves future re research as well. Okay. There are lots of questions here. We're running short on time. I would love to answer them, uh, but- Do we have till 9.30 or no? Um, oh yes, we do. I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting confused. Somebody else is supposed to be the timekeeper, which is good because I'm terrible at time. Okay. <laughs> um, so have you thought about metabolomic analyses of resistant cultivars? perhaps identify a biochemical antifeedant. That Ooh. is a very good thought. I personally, um, since no one has studied this insect, I'm just trying to lay um, some basic ecology groundwork, <laughs> trying to find out when are the weevils really, uh, when is that window of time that control can be efficient? When are they laying eggs? Um, and then it's just trying to look at um, Norm naturally occurring characteristics of the plants, such as um, the shell thickness, the shell hardness that might be deterring the weevils and just trying to lay that basic groundwork. And then my hope is that <laughs> future students will continue this work with my advisor, trying to um, 
look at specific management strategies as well. Right. Mm -hmm. I should have noted who asked that question. It was Jerry Cohen, who is um, going to be our presenter on micropropagation later on. He's a professor in horticulture here and metamolomics are his, one of his interests. Awesome, very cool. So um, this question comes from Jacob Snelling, who I think is in Oregon. And he says, filbert worm damage can appear in the basal scar, but I'm not sure you folks have that pest in the Midwest. Yeah, that's a um, good point. So filbert worm is a moth that can cause kind of similar looking damage. They can, um, they deposit eggs inside of the hazelnuts as well. And those larvae also develop inside the kernel. Um, so the damage can look similar. My understanding is there's usually webbing because the moths um, kind of secrete this like silk-like material like spiders and they form this kind of webbing inside of the nuts. So if you're seeing hazelnuts that um, the kernel has been eaten but there's webbing inside and they also make exit holes on, their, on the nuts to exit the hazelnuts, but they're usually smaller um, and then you would see webbing inside if you cracked it open. So that's how you can distinguish. So if you have um, been seeing that kind of damage, let us know because we don't really know the distribution of filbert worm. We haven't been seeing a lot of that. I haven't seen any of that damage here in my fields in Minnesota. So um, that's something that we're trying to get bearings on how um, widespread is filbert worm here. It's a problem in Oregon. So we're not sure if it's spreading to the Eastern states or if it could. Okay. Um, any consideration of planting hazelnuts with other species of plants? Um, would biodiversity help mitigate um, weevil damage? That's an interesting question. I think maybe if you haven't, if you haven't had weevils in your planting, that could be, that could maybe work. Um, if you have some pretty established weevil populations, those larvae are gonna be in the ground right there under the plants. So they can probably easily find and reinfest the hazelnuts year to year. If you haven't really had any weevils yet in your, planta in your hazelnut plantation, that could be something you could consider. Um, no research has been done on it, but I've wondered if maybe alley cropping was something that's a little taller. I don't think they're super capable <laughs> flyers and so I think tall grass kind of impedes them. Normally um, these are forest insects and um, are kind of in areas that don't have a ton of grass cover is my understanding from the from um, the little bit of literature that is published on them. Okay this question comes from Jeff Jensen. Uh, what are your thoughts on harvest time and actual harvesting the nuts before the larvae start falling to the ground to continue the cycle? In Iowa, we always are harvesting by Labor Day and often a week or two earlier, depending on the growing season. That's a good question. We are usually, from my, from my understanding, I, I don't, this is my first year harvesting, but from talking to Lois and Jason, <laughs> this is like, that's the same timing that we kind of are harvesting here as well in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, but as of like sanitation like that, like um, I don't know there, how much it would. Um, so definitely, I think sanitation, like picking up those nuts that have fallen to the ground, um, if it's early enough, could prevent um, the larvae from exiting and burrowing. However, if the nuts are falling, I, my understanding is they're pretty fast <laughs> at getting out of those hazelnuts. So I don't know how much this would prevent um, them from getting into the ground and then emerging again the next year? That's a good question and definitely something that needs to be studied. Um, Jenny Bardeen asks, it would be great to know if chickens can help control hazelnut weevils. There's a niche market for chicken raised under hazelnuts and they fetch a good price per pound. Um, somebody else suggests ducks. Cool. Yeah. I, yeah, that's definitely something you can look into. So um, Lois is going to be exploring that question with the grower who has chickens and multiple hazelnut fields. Um, so not something that's been investigated, but it'll be really interesting to see for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Lois, Jason has a question he'd like to jump in. Okay. Good. Hey, Haley, could you talk a little bit more about the that Rosemont planting? Uh, you know, we receive hazelnuts up in Ashland for the processing facility from growers all over uh, the upper Midwest. And this last year, Ariadna, who I think is on the call, uh, she, uh, as part of another project, uh, in, looked at individually over 115,000 nuts across four different plantings. And we have uh, never seen um, uh, weevil damage over about 6% in terms of the percentage of nuts that are damaged. Now, when the Rosemont nuts have come to us in the past, they typically do have high weevil predation rates. So is there something unique about that Rosemont planting in terms of proximity to oak trees or something or other uh, vegetation, or is it simply just because that planting is so old that the populations have built up over time? Is that something we should expect for growers as the plantings get older, these populations build up? Yeah, very good point, Jason. I know, um... From some growers I've talked to um, in the Driftless area that um, they are seeing some high levels of weevils and I wonder if that's because there is a lot of um, forest in their area. The Rosemont planting that I was referring to does have um, a woodlot right adjacent to it. From looking in it, it didn't seem like there were a lot of oak trees or even wild hazelnuts that I could find though from just a quick scan, but I think maybe proximity to wood lines definitely would increase the rate at which they would be infesting your newly planted hazelnut um, field. Um, and then it is an older plantation. Lois, do you know how many, how many years has it been there? I'm sorry, I was reading the questions. What, what planting are you talking about? The Rosemont planting. Um, the Rosemont planting, there are three different plantings together and the oldest one is 2000. So uh, there's been plenty of years for the population to build up there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think definitely as your planting is aging, <laughs> that you could have um, definitely populations build up over time. The St. Paul planting, um, how old is that one, Lois? Um, that was planted uh, 2009. Okay. And that one is interesting to me because that one is actually just in a resident, it's on St. Paul campus. So if any of you have been to St. Paul campus, it's surrounded by residential area and the campus. So there isn't, I mean, there definitely are oak trees, but these are the hazelnut weevils. So they're not infesting oak trees and there's really no wood lines anywhere nearby, it's houses. So that mm -hmm. one is really surprising to me that there's such a high weevil population there. And that one I'm guessing has just um, also built up over time. Maybe the weevils were transported to the um, field unknowingly from seed or from um, plants that were moved. So I'm not quite sure. That one's a little puzzling. I, I don't see how that could have happened unless they came in on the roots of layers because the plants there were planted from layers. So yeah. we didn't intentionally bring them in just so you could do this research. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm surprised that there's such a high weevil population there. <laughs> right, right. And then Haley, um, one other question about um, shelf thickness as a, a, a means of resistance. Have you found any correlation there in terms of the, perhaps the thicker the shell, the less likely they're damaged or? Yeah, so that's, um, I didn't show those results because I'm not completely done with that analysis, but we have seen a correlation that the thicker the shell, the more it deters the weevils. For sure. I have, we have um, done that part of that analysis and the answer so far is yes. We want to repeat it this year. We also want to, there's one research group in Italy who previously found that the timing of the shell hardening is also something that um, they think predicts the weevil species there, its infestation of the hazelnuts. So that's something we would like to um, that's something I'm currently analyzing and want to repeat this summer as well to confirm. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a question about nematodes for weevil control and then a related question about soil insecticide diazinon. Okay, so I don't know how effective these individual um, like, I don't know how effective 
like I said, the nematodes are usually very specific to the species um, that they're you're trying to target. So like the nematodes for Japanese beetles are like specifically, um, they're from Japan and they're like specifically associated with the Japanese beetles. So I don't think currently we know if there's a nematode species that's associated with this hazelnut weevil species. Um, I know there's some work in biocontrol um, for their weevil in Europe. I'm not quite sure if it would also work with this weevil here since it's a different species from a different continent, but definitely something that should be investigated. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm about soil insecticides. That's also a very interesting question. I have not seen from the management plans in Europe that they use soil insecticides. Um, what I've been finding is that they just mainly use pyrethroids. Mm -hmm. Maybe one um, more question and then we'll have to move on. Okay, um, what pyrethroid insecticides do you recommend? And along with that, are there any downsides to using pyrethroids? Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> um, so there aren't specific pyrethroids labeled for this weevil yet in the United States. So um, I, I don't know if, I don't know if I can recommend any specific name brands. Um, you could look up what pyrethroids are labeled for things like the pecan weevil or chestnut weevil, which are other weevil pests in the United States, and um, look at what brand names they're using for those is what I would recommend. Um, and then, sorry, I missed the second part of the question. <laughs> are there downsides to pyrethroids? Oh, yes. With any insecticide, um, there are some, some downsides for sure. So I would not spray um, for the weevils, unless you are finding, um, you know, unless you are someone who's already selling your hazelnuts on the market and you're having really high infestations, the two to three uh, weevils or two or more weevils per plant and are worried about that economic damage is the only time I would recommend spraying. Okay. Um... So thank you very much, Haley. Um, as you can tell, there was a lot of interest in this topic. I knew there would be. Um, we're going to move on to the presentation about hazelnut uh, germplasm improvement. And we've got an hour for this topic with three speakers. Uh, we're going to start with Mike Demchik, who is professor of forestry in the College of Natural Resources at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. He teaches courses in silviculture and forest management, but he's been involved with hazelnuts for a long time, um, at least since 2003, when, where it, when he actually worked at Staples in central Minnesota. Um, he's going to speak first because he has to leave to teach a class. And then I'm going to come on and talk about our breeding work here at the University of Minnesota. And we're going to finish with Scott Brainerd, who is a newly minted postdoc in Professor Julie Dawson's lab at UW-Madison. Um, he literally finished his PhD, defended his PhD, I think it was February 15th. And he's been on with hazelnuts for barely a week, but his interest in hazelnuts goes back much further and he's actually already been involved with us in a big way. So he's going to, his research focuses on using advances in genetic sequencing <clears throat> technologies to improve the efficiency of selection for kernel traits in hazelnuts. So uh, let's go to Mike. So Lois, can you see my uh, slideshow and can you hear me just fine? Yes, I can. Excellent. So I'm going to start with just a basic starting point here, and I guess I should should say the majority of what I'm talking about is actually working with uh, American hazelnut, so the wi the wild material, not the hybrids. Although I will mention a little bit about the hybrids. And so the starting point of this is landscape genetics, and realistically, this is a very young field. We did not have the genetic tools until early in the 2000s to do this, and they were cost prohibitive early on. And so landscape genetics, you basically combine the idea of landscape ecology with population genetics. Literally the first article written on this was in 2003. The field's only 18 years old. And 
<clears throat> the idea behind this is the idea of scale and diversity. You basically have three levels of diversity. You have landscape level, the stuff between populations and the stuff within it. And that sounds like this, you know, big esoteric stuff, but the reality it is pretty significant impacts on how we decide to actually select plant material. If the majority of the genetic diversity is within a specific population, you know, due to the differences between each individual plant, then our decision is just to go out to any generic population and find the best one. If there's a lot of difference between populations, then we actually should go out and look for the best populations and select the best out of those. And if it's at a landscape level, then we need to go across the whole range of hazelnut and look for those things. And that's a pretty profound question. So we used a tool called microsatellites, which are sorts, uh, short sequences of repeated genetics. They are in the non-coding part of the DNA, meaning they're not subject to normal selection. So they're in the part that doesn't code for proteins. And the short sequence repeats look just like you see on the screen here. This is for A601, AC, 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 AC. It's just a short sequence and it's repeated over and over again. When we look at those individuals, moms and dads convey that genetics to the offspring. And so we can use that as a mechanism to see how things are related and how diverse the site is. And so what you're looking at with wild hazelnuts is this. And I, every photo of me in the field looks like crap. I, I, want, I want one, I'm gonna go out with a like shirt and tie and take a picture with some trees or something, but just ignore the me in this photo. This is a pretty productive hazelnut bush. You see a lot of nut clusters on it. What we're hoping to do is take that bush that generates that amount of nuts and put it into that system. This is different than the Oregon system. It's a shrub system, your grassy rows between. It's essentially a system that can be harvested with that type of equipment. And so that's what we're looking for. And our first step was selection from the wild. And so the first selection and some, if you've attended previous conferences, you may have heard me talk about this first step. These were our sites we looked at. Essentially they're across Wisconsin. They are associated with Jason Fishbach in the upper part of the state, me in the central part of the state and the Northeast because we could go there. And this is what we're looking at. They're much smaller nut sizes than the European hazelnut. And there are a lot of nuts in a cluster. So we started with the basic DNA work and we looked at five populations in Wisconsin. We chose five populations in Wisconsin because I'm here. And so we went out and got the plant material and we asked the question, is the biggest difference within population or between populations? We could not look at a landscape level because Wisconsin is not really a landscape, it's too small. And so, when we looked at it, what we found is that over 50% of the difference, the genetic variance that's there is just within population. Some plants are genetically very distinct. And so the difference between population for the sites in Wisconsin wasn't terribly high. And so that gives us a, a very quick answer. Go find the best individuals within a population. Go out, select the best one out of 100 and you get the you know, top one. And that's what the sites look like we're going into. Now, these are broad sites. There are many cases, you know, thousands, tens of thousands or more hazelnuts on these sites to look at. But there's one little issue, and this is a little issue that isn't exactly a little issue. So that's what one of these looks like when you dig up an individual small plant. You get a mass of roots duct taped together. And when you start separating them, you start finding out something really annoying they're not always the same plant. So we did some work. This, this idea made us do some work that was questioning whether these are multiclonal. And the idea behind multiclonal is simple. A squirrel goes out and puts the nuts in a hoard. They don't, re, they don't go back and refine them. And so what happens is at least two or more actually germinate. And as they grow through time, they grow into what looks like a single plant, but what is actually what's called multiclonal, two individuals that are expanding together or more than two. And so we looked at 23 of our selections and I took leaf samples from the north, south, east and west of the clumps. And what we found out of the 23 selections is that five of them were more than one genotype, 
one of them had some goofy stuff with it. So I can't comment on that one, except that that was likely a tack error when we were doing the um, DNA work. So tw of the 23, five had more than one genotype in them. That is a non-negligible per thing. 22% of them actually are more than one genotype in a clump. So that's of consequence. That doesn't mean we can't do the rest of the work, but it's something we have to be kind of conscious of. So that's step one. Step two, we had an existing pool of hybrids and an existing pool of American hazelnut selections and then some European plant material. So 163 plants. The way this thing is set up, essentially the way to say this is the further apart these dots are, the more genetically distinct they are from each other. So the furthest two apart, the one on the right here and the one on the left here, those are the furthest apart possible genetically. And so when we look at it, these ones that are these little dark marks, those are the American hazelnuts and that's where they cluster. One that's way out to the side, most of them clustering. These are the European hazelnuts that we had in there. And these are the interspecific hybrids, the hybrids, the Weschke badger, badger set hybrids. And it's almost too beautiful here that functionally what you're seeing is the American hazelnuts on one side, the European hazelnuts on the other, and the hybrids are between. It's almost like you would expect. What this tells you though, is if you look at the American uh, hazelnut uh, genetics, there's actually quite a lot of diversity in there, an enormous amount of diversity, actually more than we have within the uh, European hazelnut that we had within our sample. Which leads us to step three. You remember earlier I said that we didn't find a lot of differences between populations in Wisconsin, but Wisconsin's not the whole landscape. The upper Midwest is a big area and there's a lot of opportunities for genetic divergence across that area. And so we looked at 25 populations, 25 populations across the area and at each population we targeted collecting genetic material from 50 plants. We had four sites, we couldn't do that. And that's just simply because those sites had too few plants to get that genetic material. And they are pretty broadly spread. So this is actually a landscape scale. We have plant materials from Wisconsin, plant materials from Minnesota, plant materials from North Dakota and plant materials for Iowa. Iowa was actually our most difficult one to work with because a lot of Iowa is in agricultural fields and a lot of the plant materials you find in natural settings there actually aren't natural plant materials. They were planted in by somebody in the past. And so what we had as materials that we were pretty confident were actually material that are, you know, native material that they weren't actually planted into those sites. And for most of what you have in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the majority of the ones in North Dakota, that's also the characteristic. They, they've been there for quite a while. And I use the philosophy of this. If you torture the data long enough, it's going to confess. And so I did that. We'll start with the first thing. So geographic distance, how far apart these are on the landscape. We covered a broad area. We're talking over a thousand kilometers. So it is a big area. And the genetic distance. A person would think that the further apart these are on the landscape, likely the further apart they are genetically. And that person would be wrong and that person would be me. I thought for sure that's what we were going to see. These are, this data is each individual population compared to each other. So every possible population combination, the one in North Dakota compared to all the other 24, the next one in North Dakota compared to all the 24. And less than eight one thousandths of the genetic diversity is explained by that distance. Functionally, it, it's too tiny. It doesn't matter. Now that does not mean that there is not population level difference. It means that how far apart they are doesn't tell you crap. But there is a moderate amount of population differentiation. So they, there is some differences. We compared them in two ways. And what we found out is something between 10 to 15% of the total genetic variability across the whole landscape is represented by differences between populations but all those populations are not actually the same in how they're different. There are some major separations and it's between only a few of the populations. 
So of all of the graphs and figures I've ever made in my whole life, this is actually my single favorite one. Because when you look at this, you don't really, I, the person doesn't need to know the genetics behind it to kind of see that there's some big differences here. The first difference, if I look at this one on the right, is that that kind of salmon colored one. Those are all from Wisconsin. So by happenstance, the five initial populations that we actually sampled partition from almost everybody else. And so Wisconsin has different genetics than a lot of the rest of the range. So then you look across a lot of the ones from the rest of the, the rest of the sites we did, they're mostly this green color. The way to look at these colors is each individual plant, you divide up its genetics by how it's related to everybody else. And so if it's green in this case, that means that most of the genetics in here within that green cluster are basically similar. So if we go out to individual populations, most of those green ones, once we've selected plant material from one of them, we might, have select, we might as well have selected it from you know, any of them. And that's the same with each of these color clusters. So the first place, if we were to try to do it, the ones on the left, a lot of that green site, those would probably be ones we'd wanna select from the ones on the right. We chop it up a little more, that one that's kind of light orange and that one that's light blue, those are both from North Dakota and they are very homogeneously light orange and light blue. You'll see a little bit of that across the rest of these, but the reality is those plants are pretty, pretty genetically homogeneous and pretty different from the rest of the plant materials. You get this one right here that's got a lot of that purple. We saw that in one part of Wisconsin as well. And then you get one that's homogeneously pretty green. If we were to actually go through and look at that and say, want the highest genetic diversity we could get, we would probably try to select plant materials from the orange, plant materials from the green, plant materials from the purple, plant materials from the light blue, and plant materials from that other, that lighter orange color. And that's what we did. So there's a lot of diversity there, but most of that diversity is captured in just a few populations. Most of the populations are pretty homogeneous, but some of them are really distinct. And those are the places we're gonna to wanna to go and look for materials. To give you an idea of how much diversity is there, zero on this diversity index is, this fixation index is saying functionally that a, pop, a plant from Western North Dakota is equally likely to breed with a plant from central Wisconsin as it is to, to a plant from Western North Dakota. That's, that's like completely illogical because you know they're a thousand kilometers apart. Fixation means they are basically fixed. All, everything's genetically the same. These things have numbers of 0.02 to 0.19, way closer to just complete random mating. Honestly, I don't understand why they're so diverse. It doesn't actually make a ton of sense, but I'll give you what I think might be a reason for it. This Blake, place had a big- Five minutes left. Yep, this place had a big block of ice on it in the past. So it's relatively recently been colonized by um, the plant materials. In that time period, we probably only had 50 generations. It's conceivable that an individual plant that what came in here after the glacier is still here because of how they continue to grow for very long periods of time. Some of the populations like the one in North Dakota have a founder effect. They may have been planted by the tribes. They may have been planted by European settlers that went there, or they could have just had only a few plants that started the populations. So when I look at that question again, that scaled diversity we talked about earlier, at the landscape level, the majority of the diversity is still captured within populations. Meaning that if I wanna go out, I still wanna go and pick the best plants from within populations. But 0.286, a pretty good percent of the population of the genetics is actually between populations. So what I really wanna do is go find the best populations and then select the best plants within those. And we now have the information to do that. For a return on investment, if I select within population, I get the fastest return on investment because I get a plant that's the best of how it presents on those sites. But if I bring in genetics from these other sites and let them crossbreed, I actually get the highest novel combinations, meaning long term, in the long term, the best opportunities. And so that's what we did. We collected plant materials. 
We collected from Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota. We took five mother plants from each site, 10 nuts minimum from each site. Resulted in 2021 seeds, which uh, this past spring had 478 germinates. We're hoping to have some more germinates than that through time because sometimes these will sit for a year before they germinate. And our intent is to plant them out in a site like this. This is at our Tree Haven facility. I'm gonna be putting a fence around this this summer. And there is very limited American hazelnut in the woods around this. It's mostly beaked hazelnut. So this will mean that essentially natural pollination in here will be just with what we put within the site. And we've had various funding sources that have funded this. USDA Special Crop Research Initiative, um, essentially a number of different funding sources. And that's kind of where we're at right now. And that is my 20 minutes of presentation. 15 years ago. The hazelnut breeding cycle is 17 years, but fortunately we didn't have to start at the beginning. We started in 2006 by identifying outstanding plants in the large seedling populations that early adopter growers had already planted, mostly of West Key badger set germplasm at locations marked on the map. These pictures are of some of the growers that we asked to identify their best plants, which we then mound layered starting in 2008 to plant in our replicated trials. Here are four of the replicated trials with each selection replicated three times at each site. That is in order to be able to distinguish between variation due to site or specific location within a site and variation due to the genetics. It's a variation due to genetics that we are interested in. We started planting the plants in spring 2009 and continued adding to them through 2013. Our base, here are our breeding objectives. Our base population already has very high levels of winter hardiness, as well as relatively high levels of Eastern filbert blight resistance. So we don't think we really need to worry about these traits. Although some of the badger set germplasm gets Eastern filbert blight or EFB for short, most either don't get it at all or seem to be able to fight it off. The most susceptible lines are rarely able to sustain high yields over time. So if we select for high yield, we automatically select against EFB susceptibility. However, I've got to make a big disclaimer. EFB is slow to progress. So, and our evaluation program is still fairly young. So some selections that we think are tolerant now may prove not to be 10 years from now. Time will tell. Overall though, since high yield generally correlates with EFB resistance, overall that means that we can focus on yield characteristics in our selection program. We first identify, we first consider the quantifiable traits of kernel yield which is inshaled yield multiplied by crackout rate and kernel weight. Then we consider more subjective aspects of quality, such as crackability, fiber on kernels, which is undesirable, and bush growth form. With advice from our entomology and flavor science partners, we hope also to include resistance to big bud mite and nut weevils, and also for excellent flavor. I observed EFB, I'm reverting to talking about EFB a little bit here. Um, I observed EFB lesions on one branch on the bush at the center of this slide, right in there, in 2008, but not on any other branches until 2020. So this bush might be considered tolerant. It was the only progeny at this isolated site to have any EFB, or I should say it was the only badger set progeny at this site to have any EFB 
but the plants were adjacent to some highly susceptible hybrids from another source. So we know that inoculum was present because the plants in the upper right corner here are from that other source at the same location. So we know the inoculum was present. However, it didn't produce large quantities of nuts either. So it was never a candidate for replicated trials. We first started collecting yield data on the entries in our trials in 2012. And by the end of 2016, had identified eight we thought were good enough to move forward. We continued to collect data. And by 2019, we added several others. We now have enough plants of some of our selections to be able to aggregate nuts into samples of sufficient size to run through our processing equipment. This helps us better see the differences between them, which really enhances our confidence in these selections. 9-2 is ranked number one because of a combination of traits, specifically consistently high yields and relatively large nut size. But if we were selecting for beauty, it would be a loser. Fortunately, the heavy fiber on its kernels rubs off easily after roasting, so it is not a disqualifier. So what are our next steps? To get these plants out into more trials and to growers. They don't do any good if we don't get them out onto the landscape. We've been working with a micropropagation lab in Wisconsin to micropropagate our top selections since we first identified them. But hybrid hazelnuts are proving challenging to micropropagate. It seems to have something to do with their Coralus americana, American hazelnut parentage. We're not sure. However, each selection needs its own unique, or moreover, each selection needs its own unique propagation protocol. But the lab in Wisconsin has finally had success with one of them, Eric 4 21 and we have plants in the field to prove it with three others coming along soon. While we wait for micropropagation protocols to be developed for all our selections, we are moving forward with getting them into more trials in more diverse locations, including on farms with good old mound layering. That's how we established our first trials with mound layering. However, that is a very slow way to produce the quantities we need for all the planned trials. From a typical mound layer, we can only harvest 20 to 30 new plants per year. So that's very slow. The first priority for where to plant these layered plants are the joint performance trials mentioned by Jason Fishbach yesterday. These are where we are comparing our top selections side by side with top selections from other hazelnut development, development programs, including eight selections from Grimo Nut Nursery in Ontario, two selections that have done well in Nebraska, and also, we hope soon, the new releases from Rutgers University and from Z's Nutty Ridge Nursery in New York. In turn, we have shared our selections with them. And these are the locations of some of those other trials. Starting this fall, we expect to have enough plants for trials on a few of your farms. Now I'll move on to discussing our new crosses. In 2012, before we had much data on our first generation of plants, we started making controlled crosses between our top selections. That is, the top selections to the best of our knowledge at that time. And using pollen from top European selections from Oregon State University, or OSU for short. Our objectives were yet larger nuts with higher percent kernel while retaining the good traits in our parent material, that is, retaining winter hardiness, EFB resistance, and nut flavor. We continued making crosses every spring through 2016, each year with a little more data with which to choose parents. As you might know, 
Hazelnuts bloom very early in the spring. So we need to put on pollination bags before they bloom, usually in early March. It's not fun when there's snow on the ground because we have to work with bare hands. Fortunately, the weather is much more pleasant when we apply the pollen in April. We harvest the seed in August and September, then seed them in the greenhouse the following early spring. Note the inoculation tent at the back of the photo under the white, that's white plastic. To screen for EFB resistance, we have to make sure they were exposed to EFB. So we inoculate them by spraying a suspension of EFB spores over them four or five times in April under a plastic tent to maintain the high humidity the spores need for germination. In September, we plant the seedlings out to the field. The first couple of years, we planted them on campus in St. Paul, but then we ran out of space on campus. So in 2015, we moved to Rosemount, 25 miles away. We added more at Rosemount in 2016. And in 2017, when we filled the seven acre field there. In 2018, we planted another three acres at Becker, which is an hour away from the Twin Cities. At the end of 2018, we had about 10,000 plants and 12 acres in controlled cross seedlings. Plant breeding is a numbers game. The more you plant, the better your chances of finding something good. It was a little disheartening when, at the end of a day of transplanting at Becker, the blueberry breeder happened by and told me that we could expect to get just one or two good selections out of the entire three acre field. I'm showing you all these photos for dramatic effect, to show you how much this is about waiting and waiting and battling weeds and gophers while we wait. We waited for the 2012 and 2013 progeny in St. Paul to start bearing nuts. A few did in 2017, but not very many nuts and not very big nuts either. In 2018, they bore slightly better. And in 2019, they didn't do much better either. That wasn't completely a surprise since in our first two years of crossing, we didn't use especially good parents because at the time we made the crosses, we still didn't have much data on any of our plants. We had higher hopes for the 2014 progeny planting at Rosemount, but they didn't produce much in 2019 either. We were getting pretty discouraged. However, in 2019, some Midwest by Midwest crosses from, from 2015, which were planted in 2016, did start to produce nuts. They were only in their third field season and they produced a lot. They were so dramatically different from the Midwest by Oregon State progeny that they jumped out us, at us when we walked down the rows. Most of them looked just like their parents, shorter statured, large nut clusters, that is many nuts per cluster, and smaller nuts. Although their parents were among the best of our first generation selections, our thought was all this work and we haven't improved anything. But 2020 redeemed us. The Midwest by OSU progeny started to yield, not just those planted in 2015, but also those planted in 2016, that is 2014 and 2015 progeny respectively. I hope I'm not getting you confused with all these years. The plants in the foreground are the same Midwest by Midwest progeny as in the last photo. Les, who is six feet tall, is standing at the break between the Midwest by Midwest and the Midwest by Oregon, which are back there. And there are more Midwest by Oregon, that is European hazelnuts from Oregon, all around these two rows of Midwest by Midwest. 
It was obvious which were which. The Midwest by Midwest were shorter and tended to bear their clusters on the ends of stems where they were more visible and thus appeared showier. The weight of the nut clusters, which also tended to be larger, that is more nuts per cluster, than the European back crosses, tended to bend the branches down, a floppier growth habit, which is probably not desirable for machine harvest, but it makes for easier hand harvest because you can see the nuts easier. And I am having trouble getting this cursor off the slide to progress. Can you hit your arrow button? There we go. European back crosses, by contrast, had a more upright growth form and hid their nut clusters within the bushes where they were harder to see for hand harvest. Clusters tended to have fewer but larger nuts. It remains to be seen how big the bushes will get to be, which has implications for off the bush machine harvest. The two photos on the left with the single or double nut clusters are of two of the Midwest by OSU progeny whereas the one on the right with a larger cluster of smaller nuts is of a Midwest by Midwest progeny. The Midwest by OSU are impressive in the husks, but does that translate to larger kernel size? And what about yield? In general, the Midwest by OSU, which is all of these except for these ones here, in general, the Midwest by OSU are larger, though not dramatically. As you can see by comparison with the one Midwest by Midwest selection on the right, the circled one here. But there's a lot of variability. What really matters is how well they crack out mechanically and how well they yield over consecutive years. In case you have any doubt from the photo that the nuts are any bigger, this figure should convince you. It shows the distribution of kernel diameters by their minimum dimension, which is the dimension on which our sorter sorts them. The best of the first generation selections in orange are on the left, that is smaller. The Grimos from Grimo Nut Nursery in Ontario are in the middle in blue. And the best of our Midwest by Oregon progeny in pink are on the right. Of course, bigger is not necessarily better, and the new improved nut shelling equipment that Jason has is changing our ideas about whether or not increasing nut size is really an important objective after all. It probably depends on market. What really matters is how easy it is to get the nuts out of the shells, which is influenced more by airspace within the shells than by nut size. Is there a trade-off between yield and nut size? Not necessarily. Cumulative yield is on the horizontal axis and kernel weight is on the vertical axis. So we're looking for, nut, for plants that produce nuts that are towards the top right of this figure. Those that are both high yielding and larger nuts. Not surprisingly, the Midwest by Oregon progeny, which are in blue letters, scattered to the top, whereas the Midwest by Midwest progeny, which are in red letters, scattered to the bottom. Although yield does not segregate as distinctively between the group, two groups, that is from left to right, the individual plants with the best combination of both are the Midwest by Oregon progeny. Specifically, they're the progeny of Jefferson, denoted by the letter J, and McDonald, denoted by the letter M. However, there are two Midwest by Midwest progeny, with Eric 4-21 as paternal parents, these two, that are also quite respectable for both traits. 
ERIC 4-21 just coincidentally is the one that we've been successful micropropagating. How do these results segregate out by full sib family? This figure is for kernel weight. I circled in red those individuals that are in the top 20 for kernel weight and put a red box around the family name. Three families stand out as producing the most progeny with larger kernel weights. Eric 4-21 is the maternal parent for two of them, and Jefferson is the paternal parent for two of them. The Eric 4-21 times Jefferson family also produced, produced many top plants for other parameters, such as kernel percent and yield. However, part of the reason it looks so impressive is simply that there are more plants of this cross than for any other cross by far. That was just luck of pollination, how it worked out, it wasn't planned. I've got a series of graphs just like this for other traits such as yield, percent kernel, etc. But this information is primarily the interest of plant breeders who are trying to figure out which parents produce good progeny. So it would be worthwhile to make more of those crosses. I will leave them appended to the end of this presentation for people viewing this online. Breaking down the data by family might be useful if, instead of releasing vegetative, vegetatively propagated cultivars, we decide to release seedling families. Growers probably don't care as much about the segregation of genes as about whether there are any individuals that combine all the best traits. The answer is that yes, there are. This table puts together the three parameters we're selecting for, kernel weight, percent kernel, and yield, and ranks the top progeny in order with the best at the top. Rankings are based on an index, which is two-year kernel yield. Kernel yield, remember, encapsulates percent kernel, multiplied by kernel weight. In other words, the rankings take into consideration all three of those parameters. And that's why if you look at any one of the parameters by itself, top one isn't necessarily in order. So um, black writing denotes 2015 Midwest by OSU progeny, and blue writing denotes 2014 progeny, that is plants that are a year older. So most of the top selections were actually from a, a, a more recent or younger cohort. That is probably because we chose better plants in 2015 than 2014 because we had better data on which to base our choices. Two of the Midwest by Midwest progeny also made the top 20. Those are in orange. But they did it on the basis of two years of yield, whereas the Midwest by Oregon State progeny out yielded them with just one year of harvest. Only time will tell how they perform in 2021 and beyond. The most important take home points from this data are that all 20 plants listed have larger kernels, sometimes much larger kernels, than the average of our top eight first generation selections. This is also true for plants that didn't make it to the top 20 list. Maybe they were in the top 30 or 40. All 20 plants also had higher yields in 2020 when they were in their fifth and sixth leaves, that is how many years they've, since they germinated, then the average of the top eight first generation selections did in their eighth leaf, that is at a younger age. Although we have observed even higher yields at other sites and other uh, germplasm, these yields are still very impressive as a group. We should note, however, that these plants were generally larger than the first generation selections were at the same age. So this may not translate into higher per acre yields if we find that they need wider plant spacing. 
we also don't know how they'll perform in future years. Improvements in kernel, in percent kernel, that is shell out rate, were not as notable. Only 11 out of the 20 had a percent kernel that was better than the first generation selections. And none were as good as the highest value previously recorded. Gray numbers are those that are lower than our past averages. Eastern filbert blight has not been observed on any of these top 20 so far, knock on wood. Um, they are still young plants and the disease progresses slowly. Again, I'm having trouble there, okay. There are no fatal flaws recorded for any of these selections. Our new cracking equipment can handle thick shells, which are correlated with low percent kernel. And kernel fiber ought, not, ought to be able to be removed during the roasting process. We will test that before we move any of these forward. So what are our next steps? Continue to collect data on these plants for at least two or three more years. We're never confident in any selections until we have two or three or preferably even more years of data on them. And then we'll put the top selections into micropropagation. We're hopeful that they might be easier to propagate because they are three quarters European as opposed to half European. And it seems to be the American germplasm that is the problem for micropropagation. We will also use the top selections as pollen parents for new crosses, um, especially if they have traits that we don't have in our current germplasm. And we will also mount layer them to get clones for replicated yield trials, even as we start trying to get them started in micropropagation, because micropropagation micro takes several years before it can be refined for each specific selection. And then if the replicated yield trials suggest that they really are good plants, then we will select the best to release to the public as our second generation or maybe our third, we'll see. This figure is of yield data from the same Midwest by Midwest progeny I discussed earlier. There is some discussion in the upper Midwest hazelnut development community about whether, given the difficulty we are having give, getting our selections propagated, and given the ecological resilience that seedlings theoretically should have due to their genetic diversity, maybe we should forget about releasing clonal varieties and focus instead on, on releasing seedling varieties. This has been done with some other crops. That is, maybe we should identify some full sibling seedling families that produce progeny that, although not identical, are more uniform than open pollinated seedlings and half sib seedlings families, and that on an average are better than what is currently available. Doing this would require testing to select pairs of parents with excellent combining ability. For each important parameter, not only would we want families with high mean values, that is, not only would we want, that would be about the mean for that cross, and is, that's probably the best cross of any of these here, but what we would look for is um, a family that has very little variation from top to bottom, where very few of the progeny sort out at the bottom of the list. So um, in this figure of the five Midwest by Midwest families we've produced so far, shows that all five included a lot of duds, these duds that produce hardly any nuts at all. Even the same families that have very high yielding nuts. So in other words, we want a graph that looks like maybe this with no plants occurring down there. 
If we take this approach, we would also have to play, pay close attention to traits for which uniformity is important, such as maturation date, which is important for efficient mechanized harvest. In fact, that's one of the big reasons why we want clonal varieties. That is just one idea. We don't know if it'll work. Um, and even if it doesn't, some of the mech some of the tools we use to evaluate whether it would work are exactly the same tools as we use to move forward um, taking a more conventional approach of trying to develop top selections for clonal varieties. Starting in 2020 and continuing into 2021, we are making best by best Midwest crosses specifically to test the idea. Now that we have better information on our parents than we had when we began, these progeny should be even better than the Midwest by Midwest progeny we produced earlier. So even if the idea of uh, seedling varieties doesn't work out, we should get some superior progeny out of these crosses. We are also introducing germplasm from the Rutgers hazelnut breeding program, thanks to Tom Molnar. Finally, now that we have some genomics people joining our project, we are making crosses specifically for the genomics work. These include a five by five dial population with five of our top selections and two linkage mapping populations using pollen from Rutgers selections. Although it will be a few years before these progeny, which are just now being seeded in the greenhouse, produce nuts to evaluate, we will get further, we will, they will help further the development of the genomic models that Scott Brainerd is starting to work to develop now. Scott is our next speaker, so he can tell you more about that. As for those 2012 and 2013 progeny that turned out to be duds, off with their heads. Plant breeding is a brutal business, but we had to clear out space to make room for the new. My assistant likes to call big hazelnut plants that don't produce any nuts, big dumb green things. And I think he got that idea from Norm Erickson, who's one of our hazelnut growers. So that's the end, and I will now take questions. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, yep, we can. Um, great, well, um, sorry that we didn't get to see the entirety of Lois's slides, but this, um, what I'm gonna talk about is not unrelated from the breeding work that she's doing. And so hopefully continue to provide some perspective on how we're going to pursue breeding approaches going forward. Um, so as, uh, as Lois said at the beginning, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at UW-Madison in Professor Julie Dawson's lab. And uh, we are working to study the genetic control over key traits in hazelnut with the goal of improving the efficiency of breeding for these traits. Um, the sort of rationale behind this, so as we just saw in Lois's talk, the phenotypic selection where you make decisions on who to cross with who and what progeny to advance the next generation is a very resource intensive task, involves a lot of land, greenhouse space, and a lot of labor uh, to phenotype the bushes by hand, as well as just the work of making crosses and, uh, and handling seed. And Today, uh, as Mike said, this wasn't always the case, but increasingly it is the case that genetic information is extremely cheap to gather on lots of bushes. So if we had a way where we could use genetic information to make decisions within a breeding program, this would allow for screening larger families 
and increasing selection intensity. As Lois also said, breeding is a numbers game, and this would be one additional source of information to use to increase the numbers. So I'm going to be using this term molecular markers a bit throughout my talk. And um, just to give, just so we're all on the same page, a marker is a bit of DNA, a bit of uh, DNA sequence that is close to that in, in this diagram, uh, I'm representing it as being close to a gene that might be controlling a trait. Uh, and there's many different kinds of markers. Mike mentioned one type at the beginning uh, of the talk, simple sequence repeats, which are repeated sequences of DNA. Uh, markers can take many different forms though. Some of them can be just single base pairs that are different across individuals. And uh, what we seek when we are uh, doing this kind of research is markers that are, that are variable across uh, populations and ideally are very close, closely associated with particular genes uh, that control the traits that we are interested in. So there's two ways that we can use markers in breeding programs. The most intuitive that uh, I think there make it would be the, the first way that you would think about using markers uh, is that if you have a if you have a trait that is controlled by say one gene or mostly controlled by one gene and can find a marker that is closely associated with it, you can perform screening at germination. So you can take a leaf punch from a hazelnut plant as soon as it germinates, sequence this particular marker and uh, identify what its performance will be when it grows up. So obviously this is super valuable for traits that take a long time to score, such as EFB resistance. So here on the right, I'm showing, so this is in wheat, but um, this is true for a lot of resistance genes that uh, they are largely controlled by a single gene. And that gene is, is what we call dominant. So hazelnuts are diploid, they have two copies of every gene, but you only need one copy of, of many genes in order to see the phenotype. So in this case, to see the resistant phenotype, you only need one copy of the gene. With markers, so not only do we not have to wait a really long time to see whether or not the disease emerges or doesn't, we can identify these heterozygotes. So these ones that have one copy of the resistance allele, one copy of the susceptible allele, this would appear to be a resistant uh, phenotype, but it would give rise to 25% susceptible progeny. So the markers not only give us a way to screen, project, screen individuals earlier, but also it gives us a more high fidelity signal of their true, uh, well, their true genotype. Of course, not all traits are controlled by a single gene. And in case, and in fact, many agronomically important traits like yield, for instance, is kind of classic example of a trait that is composed of many sub-traits and all of those sub-traits may be controlled by many, many genes. And so if we want to make selections uh, based on those much more complicated, what we sometimes call quantitative traits, it's useful to not seek out the actual genes that are controlling this trait, but simply uh, develop a theory that individuals that are more closely related to each other will have phenotypic performance that is closely related to each other. And we can then use the genetic information to estimate this degree of relatedness. So here on the top, I'm just showing this big matrix where the rows are markers and the columns are individuals. And we can, again, this is really cheap now to get thousands of markers uh, for each individual in a large population. And this clustering diagram at the bottom just shows that you can use that information to build a model for how closely related individuals are based purely on the correlation between their genotypes. And you can train models using this type of information uh, to predict, to see how phenotype performance co-varies with the degree of relatedness between individuals without actually knowing exactly what genes are controlling a trait. So we're going to do this, uh, both of these approaches using as our sort of trait of interest, our uh, the kernel traits that we can extract from digital images. There's obviously a laundry list of traits we'd love to focus on, but for this stage of the research, we do actually need both uh, phenotypes and genotypes. And as I said, phenotypes take a long time to acquire. So this is just one set of traits that we'll be able to get by taking photos of both in-shell and kernel uh, samples from a given bush. We can then identify the, um, the in-shell or kernel object within these images and get very, very precise and uh, fast measurements of their size and their shape and thereby estimate percent kernel. And this is the kind of data that we can generate. 
Um, as Lois mentioned, I just started. So this is this is a, a small su subsample of the kind of data we're going to produce, but it will give us sub millimeter resolution on um, key traits related to the size and shape of the nuts and the kernels. And that's also very important for this kind of analysis is having extremely precise measurements um, in order to pick up variation that might exist. We're gonna be studying two populations uh, that have kind of contrasting characters to them. One is a controlled cross uh, where we, of, and so these are hybrid hazelnuts. They were, uh, this cross was made by Mark Shepard, I think in 2008. The bushes are now growing in here down near Madison in Southern Wisconsin and Stoughton. There's about 250 bushes in this population. And uh, we know its parentage. We know the mother and father from this cross. Uh, the other population we're working with is a population of wild American hazelnuts from the DNR. These are growing near Barneville, Wisconsin, and there's uh, about 500 bushes that are bearing there. Um, so we are also sort of constrained for this analysis to populations that are already mature and bearing. Um, and so these are, uh, these are two that are close to us down here in southern Wisconsin and seem promising. So in the case of a controlled cross, this is just sort of a representation of uh, graphically what you would expect to be happening. So this upper cross represents two individuals that are distinct from each other, and this would be their progeny. So you, uh, I'm trying to show here with these colors that you have a sort of narrow amount of genetic diversity in this kind of a population because you only have two parents represented. But uh, if there is relevant genetic variation in this population, you'll have a good chance of picking it up because the alleles represented here as red and blue are present in at, at high at high relative frequencies. Th this is different from a situation with the wild American bushes where we have a lot more alleles segregating, so a lot more sort of colors in the population, and some of them have really low frequency. And so it, that's a challenge from an analysis perspective. The advantage of working with wild American hazelnuts is that, well, A, there's a lot of diversity as we heard from, from Mike, um, and B, uh, this is an excellent source of uh, germplasm for, for, for future crosses. These could be very valuable parents in any, um, in any breeding program focused on the upper Midwest. So the sort of timeline for this approach is that we're going to phenotype harvests from 2019 and 2020 from both of these populations that's underway. Um, and we will genotype all of the plants. So this is an, again, a little bit of a difference from just say traditional phenotypic selection where you might only look for the top performers. Here we want to genotype and phenotype the whole gamut of uh, top performers and poor performers in order to see that variation and see what uh, unique genes affect the performance of, uh, or contribute to the higher performance of the best plants. So in the, I, I sort of tried to give some dates here, just rough estimates of when we think, you know, so probably next year we will be producing these statistical models and uh, it, hopefully in time for the 2023 crosses. So it's two years from, from now, hopefully we will have some uh, additional information with which we can uh, guide the decisions of people like Lois as they are making crosses in 2023 and deciding which individuals to use as parents and which progeny to advance to the next generation or to the next uh, wider environment trial. And this is just to give you a sense that this kind of research, I think it's very important. We have limited resources in crops like hazelnuts and it's, uh, I think it makes sense to develop methods that allow us to use those resources as efficiently as possible. It's, uh, I think that sort of Underinvestment is what has um, led to slower progress in these perennial crops than in other crops. Um, but this is a process that takes time. So it will be a couple of years before we are even really able to use this information to aid breeding work, which, as Lois just mentioned, is itself quite a quite a timely or uh, qu quite a time consuming process in a crop like hazelnuts. Um, so I just want to thank our, the, the funder for this project is the USDA uh, NEFA program, Specialty Crop Research Initiative. And we have lots of collaborators, um, obviously University of Wisconsin, um, where I am, also the University of Minnesota, uh, Savannah Institute, and the UMHDI. Um, so we've had, I guess we've been under-resourced in the past, but it really feels like we're getting a lot of um, great support and uh, interest these days. So. Thanks everyone. And that's all I had to present.
Thank you, Scott. Um, we've got one question. Any ability to identify markers for each S allele? Uh, by S allele, you mean, I, I think, the self-incompatibility alleles in Correct. hazelnut? Correct. Correct. Um, yeah, that's a technical possibility. That is, uh, so self-incompatibility in hazelnuts is um, a genetically controlled incompatibility. So you cannot self a hazelnut. Uh, its pollen will not fertilize its uh, pistillate flowers. So this is due, I believe, to a, a, a protein on the male that is on the outside of the male gamete. And um, so this is essentially an entirely genetically controlled trait. And um, in many species, this has been worked out pretty rigorously. There's usually a whole range of S alleles. There can be 50, you know, there can be many, many, many S alleles. Um, and in European hazelnuts in Oregon, they have begun developing genotyping methods to know which S alleles, which two S alleles a given hazelnut plant will carry. And they use that information to release pollinizers along with a given cultivar. Um, we're not at that stage yet. We don't know the, um, the S alleles for a given, for in, in the hybrids that we're developing or in American hazelnuts. So we confirm that just by making the cross and seeing if it works or not. Um, but yes, in principle, that would be, uh, that would be a great use of molecular markers. Mm -hmm. Another question is what kind of traits can be identified by a single marker besides EFB resistance? Yeah, so I use the example of EFB because it's a, I, it, I think it illustrates the, the potential of this approach. EFB is actually controlled by both, there are both single R genes that, uh, that, can, uh, that can impute resistance to EFB, um, but that resistance is not um, resistance that will hold up against every strain of EFB. And more durable resistance, as they say, uh, that, that is harder for the EFB pathogen to overcome is actually quantitative in nature and, and controlled by many genes. Um, so EFB is actually a, a kind of complicated uh, trait in reality. Um, and it's the subject of a lot of research, especially in Oregon and New Jersey, where they're trying to grow very susceptible. They're starting with a very susceptible um, germplasm base. Um, so what other kinds of traits could be single gene traits? Um, so, you know, I, I think many it, 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 yeah, uh, it's, it's hard to say ahead of time, like what, uh, yeah, what exactly constitutes a single gene trait or where you're going to find a gene that affects the majority of the variants. Oftentimes traits that are measured on quantitative scales are quantitative in their genetic nature. So they are highly polygenic. So a trait like kernel size or, or percent kernel, we would imagine will be controlled by, by many genes. Um, but there might be two or three that impact an overwhelming percentage or a majority of the variants. Um, often simple biochemical pathways are controlled by single genes. So the production of certain flavor compounds, the, certain, the production of certain plant pigments, um, those will be single gene traits. Um, whereas, you know, more just sort of intuitively co complex traits like plant habit, um, will be will be controlled by more um, will be controlled by more genes. An interesting example I just learned is in walnut lateral bearing in walnut uh, is actually a single gene trait, which is odd because you would think that that would be very continuously, but it's actually a, a sort of binary phenotype that they observe in in California walnuts, and that's something that I was thinking about because that's a, obviously a huge determinant of yield in many fruit and nut crops is uh, the density of female flowers. Um, so whether that also exists in, in hazelnut, we don't know, but mm -hmm. that's why it can be hard to predict ahead of time right. what the nature of the genetic control will be. Right, what, what is meant by lateral bearing? Uh, whether they produce female flowers just to, on the terminal buds or on-, or on uh, Lateral buds. Yeah. Okay, um, what type of markers are you using? GBS, question mark? Yeah, so we are using GBS sequencing approaches to uh, get the genetic sequence uh, of these plants. So GBS is a way of, the hazelnut genome is about 400 million base pairs. So that's a lot. Uh, it's not 
a lot, I guess, in relative to other species, but it's obviously, it's a lot. <laughs> um, and we will sequence a very small percentage of that genome when we do our genotyping approach, where we break up the genome into little pieces and sequence little snippets of it that are more or less evenly distributed across it. So we will sequence the genome in little 150 base pair chunks. Um, and from those 150 base pair chunks, we can identify many different kinds of markers. Um, the most common are what are called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are individual base pairs that are different. So one individual might have an A, another individual might have a C, and that would be your marker. Does it have an A or a C? Um, these are very commonly used in plant breeding because they're cheap and can be identified um, readily. They aren't the, so they, they aren't as potentially informative as the SSR markers that Mike was talking about, which can have many, many different, many different alleles, many different copies, not just two. Um, and so we are thinking about ways of using, uh, of, of calling more complicated or more uh, variable markers from that 150 base pair read, but that's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what we're thinking about right now. Mm -hmm. This is the cheapest way to, to do things uh, today. Right. Thinking about the lateral bearing um, makes me think, so that's basically the location of the nut cluster on the stem. Um, we might actually see something like that in hazelnuts. Now, yeah. does it matter? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the only way it would matter is if it affects ease of harvesting. Right. Oh. And, and potentially yield. Yeah. So thank you very much, Scott. Hopefully that's a little more efficient than Lois was. When... <laughs> you can see it, Lois? Yes. We'll have so... to go over, give her a Good morning, Renata. You need to unmute. Oh, good morning. <laughs> OK, so. Um, these are Jerry Cohen, who is professor of horticultural science at the University of Minnesota. Jerry is an expert on metabolism of auxin, the plant hormone involved in adventitious root formation, and thus an essential part of propagation. His lab is currently investigating the role of auxin and light in hazelnut micropropagation. Henata Pincelli Souza, who hails from Brazil, is a postdoctoral plant physiologist working with Jerry to overcome the roadblocks to hazelnut micropropagation by elucidating the plant hormones, metabolites, and stress compounds that come into play when we attempt, attempt to micropropagate hazelnuts. Okay, thanks, Lois. Um, so uh, I have to start this by uh, uh, expanding on what Lois said. So. Throughout my career, I've had this uh, uh, interesting dichotomy between uh, uh, the kind of uh, basic research approaches that um, uh, we do and uh, their application. As a matter of fact, I, I worked for uh, um, 18 years for the USDA and my role was to bring basic research into agricultural science. Um, so the kinds of things that we're gonna talk about today are based on that general concept of, um, we're, we're a lot looking for um, micro victories most of the time, although we get some. Um, we're actually looking for broad developmental biology answers to questions. Um, and so I'm gonna give you a small fraction of what we work on that's related to hazelnut. Um, but our, our lab is interested in the, in the biochemistry of signal molecules, especially auxin, broadly in plants. And um, with that context, uh, most of the things that we do are looking for things which will solve big problems. And the big problems are, are how, do you, how do you induce root formation or how do you move plants from tissue culture into the greenhouse? Um, the kinds of stress biology that would accomplish that. So we have both stress biology questions and we have auxin questions. Um, and I tell you that because we're gonna, we're gonna then focus on specific small accomplishments, um, mostly related to what Ternod has contributed. Um, but with the idea that we, our, our ultimate goal is to be able to uh, induce adventitious roots on, on woody plants, um, 
in a, in a concerted way, not to produce this variety works and that variety doesn't work, but to actually come up with a global answer to those kinds of questions. Um, and, and so that's, uh, I think it's an important part of um, uh, the approach our lab does. Um, if you um, do research, you can do research without money and with money. And we've discovered over the years that with money works a lot better. And I used to work for, um, well, Forever Green as University of Minnesota um, uh, program, um, funded on state funds. Uh, Don Weiss is uh, my mentor in that program. Um, that's fund, funded a lot of our research. Um, uh, USDA NIFA funds a broad swath of our research from very basic research on uh, uh, oxen metabolism um, to uh, uh, Molly Tilden's uh, PhD research. Uh, she was a, a NIFA fellow. Um, she got her PhD in December um, and she continues to work with us. Um, and the NSF uh, Plant Genome Research Program, I uh, also work there. So um, these are all comfortable funding agencies because uh, uh, I've given of my blood to them and now they're giving of their cash to me. Um, and so it's kind of a nice synergy. Um, if you look at um, uh, micropropagation of hazelnuts, and my, my claim to fame in micropropagation is uh, uh, that I worked with great micropropagators over the years, uh, some famous, some just hardworking. Um, I first learned to do tissue culture by Tosh Marashigi, and most people know of his media, uh, Marashigi and Scoob Media. Um, and then uh, Peter Carlson, who did a lot of protoplast work, was another one of my early mentors. Um, but uh, if you break it down, you can see that there are steps involved in the process. Uh, one is to uh, get plants out of the greenhouse, uh, initiate buds and culture, but uh, between one and two is sterilization techniques. And we have these things broken down in what we call roadblocks because they each represent a challenge in order to get an effective um, uh, tissue culture method and some of those roadblocks are pragmatic. Uh, we just have to try a lot of things. Um, that's really uncomfortable for us because we're uh, kind of answer people. Um, we're biochemists and biochemists uh, really like to uh, um, bring things down to uh, uh, individual reactions and individual, uh, we're, we're what they call in science reductionists. You hear a lot of people in agriculture who are looking at, uh, uh, environments. You heard earlier this morning about landscapes and landscapes across multiple states. This is the anathema what we work on. We work on bringing things down to individual reactions or signal molecules and how they work. And so we're reductionists. We, we look at micro, micro events um, that might have uh, large uh, um, payoffs. And so some of those roadblocks that we've accomplished, we've gotten plants in the greenhouse as our bud source. We've developed methods, really good methods for uh, getting rid of contamination. Uh, we've been able to overcome uh, winter dormancy because uh, as much as I'd like to sleep all winter in Minnesota, because I'm a Californian and suffering winter in Minnesota is still hard for me. Um, we decided that it's better to work in the lab all winter. And so we've developed methods for breaking dormancy so that we can do tissue culture work all year. Um, and that keeps Renata busy, right? Uh, you're, yeah. you're, you're on, you, you can't keep putting your microphone off. You have to keep talking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. We have a lot of uh, protocol for sterilization. And also we apply chilling treatment to break dormance. Usually we use, um, six weeks of chilling. And uh, we also apply this method in our plants that we keep on greenhouse. And then later on November, we move all the plants to a cold room for six weeks or a little bit more. And, and then GA, we move back. And we use GA4 as a, yeah. uh, uh, to induce that. And people often ask, well, why don't you just use gibberellic acid and uh, uh, you know, we're biochemists, so I'm going to tell you, um, GA4 is the native gibberellin in uh, hazelnut, and um, uh, it is not persistent. Um, so the mechanisms for um, metabolizing GA4 exist in hazelnut, whereas GA3, um, which is the cheap one you can buy in any uh, 
uh, garden shop. Um, GA3 is not a native uh, gibberellin in uh, hazelnut, and it will not break down, and it will give you persistent effects over long periods of time, which for us is undesirable, and oftentimes is undesirable in agricultural practice, because it will give you uh, long shoots that are not uh, uh, highly lignified and will cause other problems later on down the road. So GA4 is the um, is what works well in the system. Um, like many developmental events in plants, uh, light is not just a photosynthetic signal, but it's a, a, a developmental signal. And um, uh, this is one of those things that um, woody plants can learn from a less woody plant like Arabidopsis. Um, it turns out that in Arabidopsis, it was uh, discovered some years ago by one of my colleagues in, uh, I don't know if she's in France or Sweden, um, both places, um, that uh, a very simple switch between dark and light um, can cause uh, the induction of um, adventitious roots. Uh, it works quite well in, uh, in hazelnut, and you can see that on this uh, picture here, um, that these very simple switches, and we use this condition, it's most effective. Um, and you can get adventitious rooting in most varieties. Um, it, it, it's much more effective in some than others, but um, it is a very effective tool for getting consistent uh, uh, root initiation along with endobuteric acid treatment. Um, and so this is just shows you that uh, you can get uh, uh, quite prolific uh, um, rooting with that light treatment. Um, we are pursuing uh, trying to understand that light effect, and uh, that's a whole different seminar. So if you're interested in it, you can have me back for that. Um, but um, oxen metabolism is a, uh, um, a key aspect of induction of, um, uh, of rooting. Um, it's been known since the, the uh, late 1940s and the early 1950s. Uh, when Kenneth Tiemann published a very famous book on the induction of adventitious rooting, that um, uh, the two auxins, endobutyric acid and uh, uh, naphthalene acetic acid, um, were very important for um, adventitious root induction. And before that, um, the uh, mechanisms for induction of rooting in plants primarily had to do with warm soil or uh, um, some, if you go back to antiquity, uh, would use uh, seeds of grains and a variety of other things to induce rooting, uh, which were an oxen source, but um, it was uh, not known exactly how they work. But since the uh, um, uh, late 1940s, uh, endobutyric acid and naphthalene acetic acid have been used. And so we know that oxen is important in this process. Um, the questions largely come is how? And it's, it is still an intriguing question, which we'll get to later. Um, so one of the things in the current project that we're doing, um, and this is a project, I, I always like it when we're turned down on something that works pretty well. Um, so we, we submitted a Forever Green proposal, which was to uh, really examine the kind of chemical uh, space that uh, um, permits uh, oxen to induce rooting in, uh, in woody plants, especially hazelnut. And we really came across with five basic chemical models of um, uh, of, of things that we would uh, approach to begin to understand um, how to induce adventitious rooting more effectively in plants. And th those are, are simply, um, one is you could think about um, compounds which might bind more strongly to an auxin receptor, that would be strong auxins. Um, that might uh, um, give you a stronger signal or be more persistent than IAA or IBA. That is to, to really look for things that um, are, uh, uh, are receptor uh, uh, ligands. Uh, and we know the receptor for auxin, it's uh, tier one protein. And so we actually know a lot about those compounds that uh, um, might, might serve as, as strong auxins. And we'll talk about that. Um, the other one is uh, uh, in forestry, um, Bruce Hasig many years ago, uh, talked about various conjugates. They talk about slow release agents. And uh, we haven't really pursued this a lot recently, but uh, it's something that is still on our list. Um, and then the other one is uh, a possibility of uh, changing the uh, uh, conjugation metabolism. Um, 
Another one is to use novel analogs that uh, um, like IBA has longer side chains um, and would require uh, proxosomal beta oxidation, kind of like IBA does. And finally, the recognition of um, the fact that gradients may be an important part. So we, we basically have a lot of chemical space to explore. And so we've been interested in that possibility. Um, our standard routing experiments is pretty simple. Um, we, uh, we talked about the light regulation. Uh, we, um, we do a, a, a high uh, uh, concentration dip for a very short time. Uh, we find that to be more effective than longer term treatments. Uh, we then transfer to media and uh, grow them uh, under uh, uh, light dark conditions. Um, and it's just shown here graphically. This is Renata's idea um, of uh, how to do it. Um, anything to add, Renata? You keep letting me talk. It's not oh, just uh, <laughs> after dipping in the IBA, we usually uh, keep in a dark for seven days and move to, to a light chamber, 16 hours light and eight dark. Yeah. And they, they start, yeah. And then after maybe three weeks, we have the first roots. Okay, so as we go along with chemical space, um, little known to most people, a uh, four chloro and acetic acid is a native auxin. Um, it's the auxin which induces uh, pea pods to uh, grow. Um, and you'll find it in uh, uh, found in a variety of uh, plants, but not every plant. Um, but it's the, uh, uh, if you eat, uh, if you like snow peas, uh, you're eating four chloro IA. Uh, there's a great paper where they found it um, in a screen of um, pesticide contaminants and they discovered it uh, in uh, canned peas. Uh, then they finally realized that it was the native auxin. And so uh, it was kind of funny, but you know, you look for chlorinated, chlorinated plant compounds. There aren't very many native plant compounds that have chlorine on it. And uh, four chloro IA is, is one of them. Four chloro IA turns out to be uh, in many bioassays about 10 times more active than uh, um, than indole acetic acid itself, the native auxin in plants. Um, and it actually is more active because it has a tighter uh, binding to the tier one receptor than indole acetic acid itself. And so it's, uh, um, it, it is a, an interesting one. And then we discovered uh, many years ago, looking for what we, we were screening in those days for mutants in auxin uh, perception, and we discovered that 5,6-dichloroindole acetic acid is about 10 times stronger oxen than 4-chloroindole acetic acid. It is not a naturally occurring compound, but we uh, reported that. And uh, a group in Japan used that to look at rooting, um, not us, but they did, um, but in something which actually roots pretty well. So it's kind of cheating um, for, for those of us who work in rooting, working on things that root easily is, is not really uh, uh, the way to do it. Um, but they showed that 4-chloro um, and 5-chloro and acetic acid were strong auxins. And, um, and so we've tested that. Um, so 4-chloro and acetic acid is uh, um, fairly recently, within the last couple of years, become uh, commercially available. 5-6-dichloro IA is not. You have to make that. Um, but we made quite a lot, lot of it, and we had it made for us. So, um, and so you can see that um, indeed 4-chloro-IA will induce rooting and uh, does it quite nicely. Um, and uh, uh, in 5-6-dichloro, but it, it doesn't do it particularly better than in butyric acid. So, um, and, uh, that, so that, that's, you know, it, it's a, uh, we have more examples of that uh, uh, where you can see it. Um, and yeah, uh, so, so it, so it is a, a, a useful entity and, um, and the 5,6-dichloroindole uh, acetic acid works also. And uh, uh, you can see uh, that. Um, or not, I changed these pictures to show the roots better. Um, so. All right. <laughs> that was my hobby last night. Um, and then, uh, but IBA again, uh, very similar to that. Um, and, not, and humble 15 is one that actually roots quite well. So it's, um, uh, it, it, but 
relative to the, the plant that the Japanese use, no hazelnut roots well. <laughs> I think that it's a, um, so, so then, then comes, you know, one of the, the uh, thoughts, and it's not a, a major thought, um, but if 5,6-dichloro-IA um, and 4-chloro-IA work well, what about IBA? Could you make the uh, halogenated analogs of indole-butyric acid? And if IBA works better than IA, would 5,6-dichloro-IA or 4-chloro-IBA work better than the IA analog? Simple question, um, but it takes some complicated biochemistry. Um, the reaction of IBA uh, to IA is not a simple reaction. You just heard about genes. It's multiple genes, and um, we've studied these uh, genes with uh, Lucia Strader and, and I, and, and we showed, uh, um, I think, quite convincingly that IBA is only an active oxen if it's converted into acetic acid. Um, why you need this series of reactions to make it a good rooting hormone is up to lots of debate. Um, but then the question is, if you're going to make a halogenated version of IBA, would the halogenated IBAs go through all of these reactions appropriately? And would they yield something which would enhance uh, uh, rooting? Because it's a, it's a pretty uh, mysterious idea that they would easily go through the, that many steps, just like their analogs would. Uh, but alas, um, you can actually get um, quite a lot of roots from, uh, from using the 5,6-dichloro-IBA in, uh, uh, in, in the Humboldt 15 variety. Um, it's quite prolific. And so that suggests that uh, indeed, uh, these strong uh, IBA analogs are effective. Um, and you can, again, you can see them uh, here um, and uh, in here. And, uh, and, and this is, yeah, you know, the nice thing about uh, screen is I can't see it. Um, but uh, this is, uh, uh, oh, okay, that's that says rose, right? Yeah, rose is <laughs> super difficult to root. Yeah, so, so rose isn't the uh, uh, impossible to root. It's uh, more difficult to root. And uh, um, so we like to have a variety of difficult ones to try. And so this was, uh, and that's for chloro uh, IBA. And so we're actually getting roots on, on that. We haven't done a statistically large enough sample to tell you whether it's better than IBA. Um, well, IBA got none, but uh, uh, we, don't, we don't know yet how good, um, but we are getting a positive result and we're quite interested in that. Um, how's our time doing? Lois, how, when, when am I done? I only have two screens. In my office, I have three screens. I can't hear you because you're on mute. Have you have maybe four minutes? Huh? Six more minutes. Oh, that's good because we want time for questions. Okay. So um, that includes questions. Yeah, that's good. Okay. okay. So one of the other things that we've done is we've made a variety of um, longer chain analogs, and we haven't tested these yet. Um, but endobutyric acid starts with four carbon uh, side chain, and it has to be reduced by beta oxidation to two carbons to endoacetic acid. Um, but then the question is, what happens if we have, for example, six carbons? Um, that would require two beta oxidations to get the response. And so we haven't, um, so we haven't tested these, but um, that's another area of, of our chemical space that we intend to explore. And then there's another one, which is a, a compound. And we've been playing with this through the uh, COVID pandemic, trying to get a company that would make it for us because they won't let me in the lab, but I, I'm about ready. I'm fully vaccinated now, so I can go back to the lab and make this compound. This is a, uh, a compound which would inhibit the conjugation of auxins, which we think um, might be an interesting thing to explore. It's only been looked at in the case of carnations, which are uh, uh, not, uh, easily rooted, and it uh, is effective at uh, allowing uh, uh, adventitious rooting and carnation stems. So um, it would be interesting to try that as well. And that is the end of our, um, 
of our slides. And so I can go up to stop share. And we're ready for questions. I do not see any questions. I can't hear you, Lois. You're very low, and that's unusual for you. Oh. <laughs> Lois, put your headset back on. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we don't have any questions in the um, in the box. So that's either a good sign that I'm so clear they understood everything, or that I spoke at a level too high that they don't have any, uh, they haven't left them anything to uh, to ask me about. We'll figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> now you're allowed. That's good. <laughs> Q&A. Oh, we have one question now. Uh -huh. Do you want to take it? Is Very, it necessary to use these in tissue culture? I got it. I got it. Okay. Is, is it necessary to use these in tissue culture? Can use it in soil-based systems? Okay. So the answer to that question is, um, I, is it we have to start in tissue culture because the, all the compounds that we work on um, are experimental compounds that we have to either make ourselves or have a commercial company make them for us. Um, they average around $3,000 per 10 grams. And if I could give 10 grams to Lois, she'd be happy to try them in <laughs> just about anything I would give her. But at $3,000 a shot, um, our SCREE grant is not quite big enough to handle that. I think that's correct answer, Lois. Yeah. I would agree. <laughs> so we, we would test them if we can, but we think it's better to be prudent and test them in tissue culture. I like that question. Huh? But actually, Lois already tested some IBA in uh, field cuttings, right? <laughs> IBA, yes, but, yeah. we, but not the other compounds. We use IBA in mound layering. Yeah, yeah. But um, you can buy IBA at regular garden variety at a garden store. Yeah, yeah, IBA is cheap. In the, but uh, these things are not. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that if they were effective that we wouldn't find a, uh, um, a commercial source that would produce them. There, there isn't anything intrinsically more difficult actually to make these halogenated analogs than there is to make IBA commercially in a, in a chemical factory. Uh, so if, if they turned out to be useful, um, I'm sure that they could be produced at uh, um, modest cost. I think I a very big question for you. Uh, so there, there's this sort of perception that European hazelnut Corliss avalana is, is relatively easy to to move through tissue culture versus anything with American hazelnut and the parentage is mm -hmm. challenging. I, mean, that's, I think that's sort of anecdotal experience more than anything else, but uh, can you say something about if there might be species differences and what those might be in terms of ease of rooting and, and propagation? Um, yeah, so I don't have any, I don't have any uh, particular experience with the European hazelnut, except, you know, one of the things about tissue culture is if you, um, if you have a lot of, if you have some standardized protocols for something, then it becomes fairly routine. And, uh, um, you know, I'm a lousy person to talk about tissue culture in general, but um, European hazelnuts have a lot of people who've worked on it for a long time. And those methods are re really well worked out for micropropagation of, of European hazelnut. Um, you know, my, my first student, uh, Anita Azarenko was the, uh, hazelnut extension person in Oregon for many years until she became an administrator. And uh, so I, I learned about this sort of secondhand, but uh, there, there's a lot of experience. So it's pretty deep. Um, we're we're kind of weird in a way in that all the, all the people who do tissue culture commercially and stuff, because like I, I preface this, I like, I like to start with that preface. We're really interested in, in um, basic science questions like, how do you how, how do you get organogenesis, and uh, how does auxin stimulate organogenesis? So we're looking for some big picture things because we want to do it for everything. Um, along the way, however, we use um, hazelnut as our model test because it turns out to be difficult, and we want difficult things. Um, but uh, European, yeah, is definitely easier um, 
with the protocols that are out there. Now, whether it's intrinsically more difficult, I don't know, but I haven't heard of them having cultivars that are, are extremely difficult. And I don't know if they've screened against those or uh, just that's not true for the European varieties. I may have missed this in your presentation, but um, from the stage you're at, how, how far are we off from uh, having plants we can plant outside in the field? Well, um, that? Uh, see, Lo Lois actually contracts with some growers, and I had a really good conversation with the Oregon ones, but I guess we've lost one of those, right, Lois? That's correct. Um, so I thought we had a good, pretty good rapport, and we could actually um, uh, help help them. And I think that some of the things that we taught them relative to light regulation were useful. But um, uh, we're we're not really uh, um, we're not really set up to be micropropagators. Um, we're we're more of developing ideas and methods and techniques people than we are for. As much as Lois would like me to give her 10,000 plants, um, that's, that's not where we're at in the scheme of things. Um, but, but, you know, we, you, I was going to say, you know, it's, that's probably not in the, in the budget stream that we have because we can do, we do what we do and I think we do it pretty well. But, um, make, uh, and I would like to generate lots of plants, but that's probably not. I think there are better people out there for generating large numbers of plants. Right. There, we're working with um, Night Hollow Nursery in Wisconsin to produce our plants. And we've also got a small contract to see if um, North American plants in Oregon can work on our material. And yeah, we have really good rapport with North American plants because they actually want to, to transfer some of that technology. Um, so, and I, I think we've continued that kind of relationship. So we're, we're, we're like idea people and uh, that's, that's, that's our role, I think. Um, although if we hit something that works really, really well, you never know. <laughs> 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 but I, I think, I think that, um, I, I think there are other people who do it. But... Right. And, and, Les says there are a few hybrids in micropropagation. That's true. Um, luckily, <laughs> so if, there there are there, there are methods that work. The question is, can we have a method that works all the time? That's the goal. Okay. Thank you very much, Jerry and Hanata. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be moving on to uh, hazelnut mechanization presentation. Uh, this is by the team of Dave Bonhoff and Scott Sanford. Dave Bonhoff is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Biological Systems Engineering at UW-Madison. Before that, he helped design a new series of skid steer loaders for the Gell Company, where he was a design engineer. He has been working on developing ad and adapting hazelnut harvesting and processing equipment since 2011. He and his wife also grow hazelnuts on their small organic farm. Um, is Scott Sanford going to be presenting is, with you? No, he is not. Okay. And I just stayed up front. This is not going to be re really be a research update. It's just an overview of harvest mechanization in general. So it's just for a much broader audience. And I think everybody can get something out of it. And we're going to be covering, I think, the results of our research uh, next year when our research project is complete. Okay. So I'll click on share screen here. I don't know what that is. That's weird. Are you going to see at the bottom of your screen? There's a green share yep. screen. Yep. Yeah, I clicked on it. Some weird uh, and uh, I'll bring this up here. This is here, and go. we're ready to go. Okay. Yep. And now you'll want to. There you go. You're good. Okay. So um, we'll move right in here. I'm going to begin with some terminology just so we're all on the same page today. I'm then going to overview some different picking scenarios and look at associated harvest operations. And I'm going to end with a very brief overview of current research and future research needs. 
I'm going to be using the term uh, in shell nuts a lot. And uh, an in shell nut is an uncracked shell with the kernel inside. Uh, this is a handful of in shell nuts. We're okay, right? Huh? Uh, a hazelnut cluster, uh, or simply a cluster, is a singular connected group of in shell nuts, each still wrapped in its involucre or husk, if you will. Uh, with respect to this presentation, hazelnut harvesting is taken to include all operations required to produce clean, husk-free in-shell nuts like the ones you see and have been shown to the right. Or, and uh, clean in this context means there's no dirt on the shells. There's nothing else in that bin except for those clean in-shell nuts. And as it notes here, in-shell nut drying, drying that goes on after you have a bin of your final product, so to speak, is considered a post-harvest operation just as it is with cereal grains, soybeans, corn, and numerous other crops. So here I've listed what I see as the seven basic unit operations associated with hazelnut harvesting. They're pretty self-explanatory, picking, cluster, drying, husking, sifting, which would be separation with screens and sieves, uh, winnowing, which is separation using air, uh, de-stoning or de-rocking, and washing. Uh, whether or not all these operations are part of your system, really depends upon the system and associated equipment that you want to adopt. And this is going to be quite clear in a few minutes. So we have these seven harvest operations. And what specific harvest operations are all employed is largely dictated by the conditions on the orchard floor and by what you are actually collecting during the picking operation. And to the right, you see four very different materials from a mixture of dirt leaves and in-shell nuts to wet and dry clusters to some nice, clean in-shell nuts. Uh, for purposes of this presentation, I've identified what I call mechanical picking scenarios, and I have three. The first involves sweeping material or scraping material off a flat and bare or relatively bare uh, surface. The second involves vacuuming material off a rough and or vegetated surface. And the third involves picking green clusters directly off the plant. So now I will overview the specific carbon harvest operations and equipment associated with each of these scenarios. Uh, as will become clear, uh, the first scenario is not well suited for the Midwest. And the third scenario is the one we are working to develop for the Midwest. So the first option involves collection material off a of flat bare surface. And this is the approach used on the West Coast or more specifically in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. If you have bare ground, it has to be flat to minimize soil erosion by water. You still get soil erosion by wind, as is evident in this picture that I took in Oregon. Uh, this farmer is preparing the surface prior to nut drop using a piece of equipment that is a combination flail mower and rower. The fact that you are waiting for nuts to fully ripen and fall to the ground means you will get more loss to animal predation and the nuts will get exposed to soil pathogens and other contaminants on that soil surface. And certainly if you have a bare orchard floor, you don't have a lot of plant diversity in your orchard. Uh, and this would be a monoculture by every definition of the word, which is arguably not very eco-friendly. Uh, in this process, once nuts have fallen to the ground, they're swept into windrows. Uh, spacing between rows is normally 20 feet and all 20 feet are put into a single windrow as you see here. Uh, here are two shots of a windrow. The one on the left is more of a close-up. Two things to note. Okay, first, almost all nuts are completely out of their involucre or husk. Second, there is not a lot. Uh, second, I should say there is a lot of debris. Uh, there's dirt, husk, leaves, sticks, and animal feces, and uh, occasionally maybe even a, a dead animal, a small one uh, that would be. Uh, these, these windrows are such that there's essentially no air movement through them. And for this reason, the windrow is generally harvested on the same day it's made, and especially if there's any rain in the forecast. Mold is a major problem if nuts are on the ground any length of time under damp conditions. And when it rains, everything becomes a muddy mess. And the rainwater becomes a transport mechanism for moving contaminants into the shells uh, of the nuts. So uh, in October of 2016, toward the end of harvest in Oregon, uh, the Willamette Valley had record rainfalls and they couldn't get the nuts off the ground in a timely manner. And it resulted in an unprecedented uh, spike in mold counts. And they actually ended up feeding a good portion of the late harvest to hogs. Uh, the fact that we here in the Midwest will on average get a lot more rains throughout the harvest means that we cannot copy this harvesting method. 
Uh, here, the windrow is being collected with the Weiss McNair 836 nut harvester, which is by far the most popular unit used in the Willamette Valley. It's a pickup system that requires a flat surface, which is one of the reasons that they grade or level their orchard floors. In addition to destroying vegetation, grading fills in ground squirrel holes, which is a major problem in the valley. A whittling operation is part of this unit. And as you can see from the image in the upper right, the amount of air movement involved just makes this a very dirty operation. There are a number of self-propelled pickup units out west like this one, but they are more commonly used in the almond, pecan, and, and walnut industries. The Italians and the Turks also make equipment for sweeping material off a of flat surface, uh, and these are two of those machines. They are both three-point hitch-mounted units, and they would be operated at a lower speed than the large equipment used out west. The self-propelled and pull-type harvesters used out west are all very similar on the inside, and this is a cross-section of the self-propelled unit I just showed you. You have a pickup belt, typically about four feet wide with molded cleats, and then you have cleaning chains, which are specific to the nut crop you are harvesting. Different chains are used for walnuts, almonds, pecans, and hazelnuts. Small stuff falls through the chains, lighter stuff is lifted off the chains, and then it's discharged through the vacuum fan. Uh, so these harvesters are performing some basic sifting and winnowing operations. I say some because much of the cleaning occurs at receiving stations, which are located on some of the large farms and at some of the hazelnut processing facilities in Oregon. Uh, this slide and the next four were taken at Crimson West Farms receiving station in the Willamette Valley. Last year, this station processed 3,500 tons of hazels, 3,500 tons of hazels. These pictures were taken in the off season when some of the equipment was still partially disassembled for maintenance. The first step in the cleaning operation is shown here and it consists of a three-stage drum sizer. Fine stuff drops out in the first stage. Inshell nuts and stuff similar in size drops out in the second stage. Nut clusters or unhusked nuts should fall out in the third stage and the remaining stuff goes out the end of the drum. The unhusked nuts and whatever goes out with them in stage three drops into the husker that sits on the floor right under stage three. The husker is not there right now, but it is here in this picture. It's shown on the right in this slide. The upper left shows the heavy metal slats that form the husker's conveyor. The lower left photo shows the husking pad that is fixed a very specific distance above the conveyor at the location that I have marked in the right photo. The husking pad is like a giant wire brush. Uh, Jeff Newton, who uh, operates the station, believes the pad came off a street sweeper. He also stated that it's likely a one-off design and that it has so-so performance, so he doesn't really recommend copying it. The Oscar has a winnowing fan, and everything that the fan doesn't blow away is set back to that drum sizer. This is the middle part of that receiving station operation. It starts with a wire mesh belt conveyor that along with an aspirating fan is used to remove more fine material along with sticks and other wanted material that, and under wanted debris that fell out in stage two of the drum sizer along with the inshell nuts. In the pre-washer that follows, uh, the inshell nuts get hit with a water spray that takes off dust and loosens cake down material. And then this is followed by a run through the washer, which is just a water bath. And the last portion of the station's operation begins with a de-stoner or de-rocker. And this is just a device that exploits the fact that stones sink faster in water than inshell nuts. And then once it's through the de-rocker, the, the nuts are elevated into a two-stage continuous flow hopper scale. And so this is the point at which the amount of material that you brought to the receiving station is determined. And once it's weighed, the nuts are stored in these bins. Uh, and different bins are typically used for uh, different cultivars. This is a receiving station at Willamette Hazelnut. And they're one of the large processors in Oregon. And it basically has the exact same elements as the station on the previous slide. And the same can be said for basically all the receiving stations and processors in Oregon. So a couple of quick notes regarding mechanical harvesting off uh, bare orchard floor as we see it done out west. It's quite rapid in terms of the acreage of material you can collect in a given period of time. That's largely why they use it. Although there is no cluster drying involved, there is a washing step, and that is something that is not practical to do in the field, which means regardless of what you do in the field, you're not going to be able to come out of there with a bin of clean in shale nuts ready for the dryer. 
The second uh, major picking scenario involves vacuum material off a rough in or a vegetated orchard floor. And when the orchard floor is vegetated, you can harvest on steeper and wetter terrains, but you still have the high level of nut predation and contamination that comes with material laying on the orchard floor. When you have an orchard, uh, vegetated orchard floor, it's beneficial to mold the vegetation prior to nut trough. And this is commonly done with your typical orchard mold that you see in operation here. This is a shot I took in Italy. Uh, vacuum harvesting enables uh, collection off uh, rough and bumpier surfaces, and some vacuuming equipment can pull material out of holes created by critters. The nut harvesting machines that we just saw in the previous slides, the ones that sweep and scrape material off surface, don't work as well when you don't have a flat bare orchard floor. Uh, when vacuuming, vegetation actually tends to be beneficial as it reduces the amount of dust that's generated during harvest. Uh, this is a, a factory unit that vacuums up material and also husk the nuts. So if you have cultivars that drop clusters without releasing the nuts, this is more the type of unit you would need. Or uh, you would get one of these pull type units. The manufacturers call these husking harvesters because of their ability to husk. The unit on the lower right is a pull type version of the factory unit just shown on the previous slide. The unit on the upper right is a Chi and Chia unit. Vacma and Chi and Chia are both located in Northwest Italy. The unit on the left is made by Hotsitsen, now a major producer of such equipment in Turkey. With all three of these units, you vacuum by hand. If the Turkish unit looks nearly identical to Italian units, it's because the Turks copied the Italian unit uh, equipment because it was too expensive for their farmers to import the Italian units. Until 2013, uh, Turkey imported much of its hazelnut equipment from Italy, who had been manufacturing equipment like this for 40 years. Uh, but because of the weakness of the Turkish lira, Hatsitsin started producing harvesters in Turkey so their farmers had access to equipment that they could afford. Right now, relative to the US dollar, the Turkish lira is a very weak currency, so importing uh, equipment from Turkey is a good deal for us. And I'll show you how great a deal it is uh, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, here is uh, uh, Tanuti Harvester, another Italian unit that is identical in function to the three on the previous slide. On the right is a shot of it being uh, used in New Zealand to collect windrow material. Uh, this group in Croatia is raking material into individual piles for vacuuming. Again, uh, anytime you're gonna windrow or pile material, you wanna collect it off the orchard floor as soon as you can, preferably on the same day. And uh, this shot shows a bag of inshell nuts being tied. Uh, this bag was just taken off the bagging platform of the pull type FACMA harvester uh, in the background. And here's just another shot of the Turkish units, which gives you a good view of the bagging platform on these type of units. Uh, Mary Hubbell of the Cross purchased this model a couple of years ago, and this is her actual machine. Uh, Jason Fishbach and I had the opportunity to run it for a few minutes. That's Jason in the yellow shirt. And because of the popularity of this and other similar units now being sold, I wanna quickly show how they work with this slide. So there are two vacuum fans up front, um, identified in the upper left. Uh, the rear of these two fans creates a vacuum in the large vacuum chamber that sits right behind it. A long hose attached to the rear of this chamber is used to suck up the material from the orchard floor. This hose is not shown, but the intake fork it gets attached to is circled right over here in the bottom right image. When material enters the large vacuum chamber, its speed is suddenly uh, reduced because of the increased, sudden increase in cross-sectional area. And all but the lightest material falls to the bottom of the chamber where it is removed through the airlock. And the airlock helps maintain a good vacuum in the chamber. Light stuff floating in the vacuum chamber gets expelled through the vacuum fan and um, material as it falls from the airlock, it enters the winnowing chamber where it gets hit with a blast of air. This blast of air is created by a third fan, which I call a winnowing fan. In the upper right image, the round yellow cover houses that winnowing fan. So if you look back at the winnowing chamber, you see a couple of pink arrows here and pink arrows are used to identify material that's being expelled from the machine. In the case of the winnowing chamber, it's the lighter stuff leaves the grass, the husks that are getting expelled. Heavy material falls down into the husker and then it moves into a drum sizer. There are four outputs from this drum sizer, two that go out in hoses, the two hoses you see there. Suck 
out one of the hoses are inshell nuts that are going up to the bagging area and sucked out in the other holes are unhusked or partially husked nuts and light material of similar size. This material is getting drawn back up into the vacuum chamber. So in my opinion, uh, the two critical elements in this machine are the husker and the drum size. And this is a close-up shot of the husker. It's a series of rubber paddles on a rotating shaft. The paddles rub nut clusters against the perforated housing and the wear bars that are bolted on the inside of the housing. The openings in the housing do not allow the passage of inshell nuts. So the only way out for those inshell nuts is through the drum sizer, which is shown here. This drum sizer is a drum within a drum. Large material stays inside the inside drum. At the rear of the drum, lighter stuff that stays inside the drum is sucked back up into the vacuum chamber, as I just noted. Um, and that includes those unhusked and partially husked nuts. Heavier stuff that stays in the inside drum is simply expelled onto the ground, and that would include stones. Inshell nuts get trapped between the two drums, and they get sucked into the bagging area, and real fine material falls through both drums and onto the ground. This drum within a drum functions just like that large three-stage drum sizer that I showed you at that receiving station. It's real important to understand that machines like this work better with dry material. For this reason, it's not uncommon to collect in dry material before running it through a harvester like this. This is very typical of what you see throughout Turkey. Clusters that have been collected, brought to a central area, and spread out in the sun to dry typically on tarps or plastic that can be used to quickly cover the piles in case of rain or heavy dew. The piles are occasionally agitated as you see here to facilitate drying. And once the, the clusters are sufficiently dry, they're husked and the inshell nuts uh, are separated out using equipment like the harvester on the previous slide. And then those inshell nuts are typically laid right back on the same tarp and left to dry uh, for a period of time. Like the two machines shown, okay, so one thing you can do here, if, if you are uh, going to bring your nuts to a central area for drying, really all you need in the orchard is a large vacuum to collect material. And I've got two of those units shown here. The one on the left is from Chia and Chia and the unit on the right is uh, from a New Zealand company. Uh, here's also a backpack unit that you could use made by Cifarelli, another company located in Northwest Italy. It claims to do a little bit of cleaning. Um, Note, if you lift up on a lever to your lower left, the bottom of the collection tank opens. So, you know, all you need to do is back up to a tote and lift up on the lever. Uh, Dr. Tom Molnar uh, purchased the Chia Chia vacuum unit uh, for their Rutgers research farm. And it's shown here in operation. Uh, Dr. Molnar also purchased these two Chia Chia pieces of equipment for their research farm. The cleaner on the left and the cracker on the right. I'm not interested in the cracker for this presentation. I do want to focus on a cleaner on the left. This shot shows that same cleaner in use in Italy. And a couple of things that are important to point out. Number one, it's meant to be a stationary unit. You are not moving it around in your orchard. Second, it is not hot. It just removes stones, sticks, leaves, and other debris from inshell nuts. If you look closely in a bin on the far right, you are not seeing any nuts still in their huts. So in this case, You'd only use this unit on material you've already ran through a husker, or you'd use this unit where almost all the nuts that you are collecting have been fully released from their involutors. And the latter is the case with the varieties that have been in development at Rutgers. Uh, Chia and Chia manufactures a lot of nut harvesting and processing equipment. This is just a schematic of a cleaning line that I took off their website. All right, no, I actually took this off their uh, Facebook page. And here's a picture off the same site that shows some of their equipment in use on a farm. And the cleaning unit shown here is slightly larger than the one at Rutgers. And in uh, the back is a large nut dryer that they make. And they even manufacture special storage bins or totes, if you will, that are shown here. Uh, this cleaner does not husk. So they're, they are likely working with already husk material or they have plants whose nuts drop free of their involucres. And I basically show you this slide because this is what we may expect to see on some of our farms here in uh, the distant future. Um, these images show hand collection material off the orchard floor on some steep terrain in Turkey. And if you look in the buckets, it's clear that the inshell nuts are still tightly held in their involucres and that the material is still pretty green. And that's why you see this in Turkey, unhusked material collected and spread for drying prior to husking. 
In the background, by the way, is a very popular harvester that I was introduced to by Sean Mellenbacher. He told me that they're all over Turkey and he showed me a video of one in operation during one of my visits with him a few years ago. And it's what they call a Dinsler Makina harvest uh, machine. Um, here's the pull type version of that unit in two different color schemes. It's a large unit with some pretty good sized pulleys and long dry belts. It's still manufactured, widely manufactured, I think. It's evidently a good husky machine and its throughput appears to be pretty good. But I have to believe from uh, a sales perspective that they're now being overtaken in Turkey by that Hotsitsin unit that I've shown you. At least uh, that's the case if I'm correct, correctly interpreting what I read from Hotsitsin. I just got some prices for you from Hotsitsin, and quite honestly, you cannot beat the price on their machines given the current strength of the dollar relative to the Turkish lira. And depending on the, the model here, you're, you're seeing 6,000 or 6,500 bucks uh, plus shipping. And I've given you some shipping rates there on the bottom. Not all that high to move a machine like that all the way from Turkey to New York. Compare this to the $46,000 price without shipping of this macadamia nut harvester as quoted two months ago to Margaret Bengri, a hazelnut farmer from uh, Yamhill, Oregon, who was thinking about trying it on hazelnuts. So it really makes you want to kind of get into the Hotsitsin equipment import business. A uh, couple key points with respect to vacuuming material off the orchard floor. First, seldom does it appear that vacuum nuts require washing. Second, depending on how wet it is, the material that requires husky may first need to be dry. You can dry like they do in Turkey. Uh, you can do it on racks inside and outside buildings like many of you do. Or maybe you can try this, covering your entire orchard floor with plastic or tarps. Uh, to be honest, I don't know what's going on here. I just came across this image on the uh, Chi and Chi Facebook page yesterday, so I just inserted it. I'm thinking it's a research site of some sort, and it looks like there's some taller vegetation under the plastic, so maybe it's just uh, it makes it easier to collect material. It absolutely keeps your collection easier and cleaner, and it ha I have to think it does facilitate uh, some drying, but I'm going to find out what's going on here. So enough on collecting nuts off the ground. The third major picking scenario is to remove green clusters from the plant. And I will focus on the first two methods which involve large mechanical shakers. The image here relates to the third method which is using a handheld shaker. And if you're interested in that, I would just ask that you Google it. And most all of you are intimately familiar with the fourth method and that's uh, picking by hand. One of our main objectives here is to capture the clusters before they hit the orchard floor. Uh, if you shake them off the plant and onto soil or a vegetative cover, you are more or less back to a vacuuming operation. Avoiding contact with the ground means minimal contamination. And also, if you're not collecting material from the orchard floor, you have several more options for alleyway use, and that includes grazing. This is a shot here of one of the sites we harvested for our research this past year, and they had sheep grazing up to a couple of weeks before harvest. My gut feeling is that it did cut into production on this site. How significant that drop in production was, I cannot say. If you're taking nuts off plants, you don't have to worry about rainfall and nuts molding on the orchard floor. Plus, when you have a vegetated orchard floor, the chances of a harvester getting stuck after a rain is significantly reduced. Harvesting like they do out west requires a relatively flat terrain. That's not a requirement when you're picking off a plant. Uh, Picking off the plant enables you to get more of the nuts before the critters. And this is really important with small plots. They lose a lot of nuts to animal predation in Oregon, but because of the size of their fields, the take is relatively small on a percentage basis. But if you only have an acre or two and you are surrounded by good animal habitat, expect to lose most of your crop to critters if you wait and let the nut, nuts fall to the ground. One of the great things about collecting right off the plant is that there are no stones in or dirt on the stuff being collected. And that simplifies cleaning, which as we will see is really important. Be aware that when you shake a plant, you will end up with more sticks and branches in with your nuts. And the problem tends to get worse the older your plants are. This is something that you need to be acutely aware of when designing picking equipment. When you are picking clusters off the plant, you more than likely will need to dry those clusters before running them through your husking equipment, as I've kind of noted. We are working on an alternative to that called green cluster husking. However, 
If you are looking at large scale cluster drying, Scott Sanford, my partner in crime at the university would recommend that you look at the bulk drying wagons like they use in the harvest of peanuts. We have about two minutes left, Dave. Okay, yep. A really quick look at tree shakers. First, they are essential in the harvest of almonds, uh, walnuts, pecans, but uh, they're not used to any degree to shake hazel trees. I've been told that hazel trees don't stand up very well to shaking, but I've not found any data to collaborate this. A study recently conducted in Oregon concluded that shaking and catching hazels from trees could not compete with the traditional method used there. But that does not mean that they may not be a good approach in the Midwest. Uh, what we have done here in the Midwest is it, to use moving over the row shakers, which is something that you can use on small trees and bushes. Keep in mind that plants can get too big in a hurry. Bottom line here is that over the row shakers will likely dictate plant selection and how you prune from year to year. To this point in time, no one to my knowledge has built an over the row harvester specifically for hazelnuts. But we know we can do it because over the row machines that were developed for other crops purchased and used on hazels here in the Midwest by some of our visionary farmers work well on hazels. Four such machines that we've been studying at the university are shown in action in a video put together by Jason, and this is the link to the video on the UMHDI website. And these four machines include um, this, oops, there was the, the site. These four machines include this BEI blueberry harvester with rotary type shaker, um, this BEI blueberry harvester with a slapper type shaker, this Oxbow Olive Harvester with a bow rod sway type shaker, and this Joanna 4 Aronia Harvester, which is rotary shaker. I should add that this is not an over the row unit. It bends over and harvests half row as it moves along the hedgerow. The same company does manufacture a self propelled over the row Aronia Harvester that takes the whole row at once. Our current research uh, project at Wisconsin is dedicated to mechanical harvesting of hazelnuts grown in hedgerows. It's being conducted by Scott Sanford, myself, and Jason. What I have here is some of the possible outputs from this project. They are self-explanatory. I'm not going to go over them now. We will be back in the field collecting uh, loads of data this fall. And as I noted earlier, our intention is to present a summation of this project at next year's conference, at which time our project will be complete. And my last future topic is my last topic is future research. And what I think we need to focus on in the near future is Husker development. We need a durable machine that is designed or optimized, if you will, for hazels, or more specifically, green hazelnut clusters. And given that we want to add this to a picker, it will need to handle a continuous inflow of material at a rate that it's being picked off the plant. And this ultimately enables all harvest operations to be completed in a one pass field operation. Our ultimate goal, as I see it, is to develop a relatively inexpensive over the road combine harvester, a unit that combines picking, husking, sifting, and winnowing operations into a single machine, a machine that, whose output is a bin of clean in shell nuts that are ready for conventional dryer bins. To keep this machine relatively light, inexpensive, maintainable by the average person and easily transportable, you're looking at a pull type unit. I would go with a rotary shaker and I would be using air and in some cases augers, but not elevators or belts to move material. Why? Because nuts can handle movement by air and augers and use of air and augers reduces the complexity and the cost of the machine. And if you are forward thinking, then you need to plan or more specifically plant today with this sort of harvest machine in mind. And I would tell you that instead of a fixed 15 foot row spacing that's frequently mentioned, that you alternate between a 12 and an 18 foot row spacing, the wider alley is gonna be needed for spraying, pruning and a pull type harvester as I see it in the future. And my last slide, uh, if you take away one thing from this presentation today, it's that harvesting equipment that you select and the harvesting operations that you're gonna to need to perform will in one way or another depend on several different factors and you can read them all right here. And that's it. We have one question. Okay. Says anyone <clears throat> tried a trellis system to flatten the harvesting surface? Has anyone tried a trellis surface to harvest, uh, find the harvesting surface? And not with hazelnuts, to my knowledge. Uh, I don't know if they are working on it overseas. They are certainly doing that with olives. And it's very interesting. Uh, and especially also the mechanical pruning that's going on. One real quick thing is what they do actually, uh, so they don't cut into product, production too great with those high density, uh, narrow, uh, plants is they prune off one side one year and then uh, the following year they prune off the other side and the product 
the drop uh, in production is very slight. So there's, there's some very interesting things that go on there with trellis systems, mechanical harvesting, and pruning. And that's all stuff that we're going to be looking at in the future with respect to uh, hazels, I got a feeling. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's the uh, end of our time. Yeah. Okay, oh, our next there. presentation is on hazelnut flavor work. And I believe this is the first time we've had um, Zhu, Zhu Wang present. Um, Zhu Wang completed her PhD in 2020 on the identification of bitter determinants of flavor in raw American hazelnuts, working under Devin Peterson at Ohio State University. Dr. Peterson started this research while he was at the University of Minnesota. The work is fundamental to understanding the chemical drivers of consumer acceptance of hazelnut flavor. Over to you, Sue. Thanks for the nice introduction. So everyone can see my presentation, right? Slice. And okay, so I will. So I will talk more about the hazelnut flavor uh, today and especially the aversive flavor traits on American hazelnut. So I will also touch on the hybrid hazelnut samples in today's presentation. And uh, at the beginning, I'd like to give some interest on the flavor study. So flavor is a multimodal sensation, include aroma, taste, and the similar sensation and others. So many research focus on the aroma studies and certainly taste also is important part as well as the similar sensation. And the aroma is usually initialized by uh, volatile compounds that are perceived by our nose. And the taste is perceived on the tongue and oral cavities and the involved interaction with the non-volatile molecules. So all these complex chemical stimuli integrated to the lead flavor experience. So the study has shown that flavor is one of the main factors that the driver consumer liking. So how much of the people enjoy our hazelnut is a very important part for the for the commercialization. So we needed to improve the high flavor, uh, the flavor quality of the hybrid hazelnut for the market. So the variety, so variety, uh, variety of parameters such as the genetic maturities and the growing environment and the post harvest hand, uh, handling practice are all influential to the flavor profiles. So therefore we needed to better understand the hazelnut flavor profile with uh, taking into this factor account. So a limited study has done on the comparison of the European hazelnuts with American's one. So I, I extracted some of the data from that paper and showing here. So in general, American hazelnuts has a different uh, the flavor profile compared to the European's one. And uh, uh, we can see in the table and the high, the high numbers show in the table means that this attribute is perceived as the high intensity. So we can say the American Hazelnuts are much more the bitter, uh, perceive the much more the bitterness than European hazelnuts. So bitterness is a general aversive attributes and the neg negatively correlated to consumer liking. So understand of the bitterness in nut, it's easy to connect to the consumer behavior. So in order to be a competitive crops and the sustainable, suppose the Midwest local market. So flavor characteristics have to be as good as or better than the European hazelnut. So therefore my work is to try to identify the main bitter compounds in American hazelnuts. And also is to try to investigate the influence of the varietals and the drying process on the level of identify, identify the bitter molecules. So in this study, the first thing is needed to be do done is try to find a way that better understand the compounds driver the bitterness. So hazelnut is a kind of is very complex food matrix contain uh, tons of the molecules. So we have to use a series of steps to get the final molecules that contribute to the bitterness. And the flavor study is try to combine the analytical 
uh, analysis with a human perception study. So we have to go elaborate the way to separate the sample apart and dissolve it in water and test it by people to understand the sensory attributes of the interest. So for uh, in detail, so for the thing we needed to isolate these bitter molecules from the for the matrix and the remains of non-bitter uh, behind that is the main purpose of the sample preparation. And then the multi-dimension sensory gas fractionation is used to, to keep follow the sample uh, with attributes with interest and then narrow down the fraction with in, uh, interest to get the final bitter profile. So lastly, uh, we use the LCMS uh, QTOF for the identification. So we did, so as I just mentioned, so we have to use uh, several steps to get to the hazelnut isolate. Once we get the hazelnut isolate and it will further analysis on our uh, uh, UPLC MS instrument. So on analytical instruments, we can and get, use a small amount to optimize uh, our computer program and uh, to separate as much as possible. And, uh, uh, and scale up this method to prep system for sample isolation and the collection. So be again, because we have to use to use a large amount to do the human perception study, so we needed to separate uh, a lot of sample on our prep system. So here I show the my some of my results. So you can see the there are tons of the compounds uh, showing this. Uh, in this in here, and uh, by separating the hazelnut isolates, uh, we can narrow down the particular region. So again, the analytical instruments only can tell us kind of digital data, but uh, they cannot tell us which peak and uh, this is bitter and which are not. So we have to, in order to target the bitter region, so we have to do the sensory screening. So based on our sensory study and the three main fractions, the 13, 15, 18, so show about the weak intensity of the bitterness and are selected for further study. And so you can see even I went through a series of sample preparation and uh, first dimension uh, separation, the, the purity of these three fractions from the, this dimension is still less than 40%. So therefore, the further sensory gas fractionation were necessary to achieve the high purity of the uh, bitter molecules. So the same procedure of the sensory evaluation are followed and all are analysis by trained sensory panel to identify the bitter fractions. So I will show you an uh, example and what I do on separation on my fraction 18. So here we can say the in order to get the a uh, single molecules peak, I have to do the several separation to get it. So it uh, spends a lot of time uh, for me to optimize and go through the multi-dimension to get the final compounds. So I hard card and selected the most bitter fraction peak on my first dimension. And uh, although it look like uh, it's only, I select the one peak, but when I went to, to the next step and uh, several peak are uh, detected on our instrument. So I have to use the same methodology to separate these molecules. So uh, because we don't know which peak and the molecules contributed to the bitterness, we need to do the human sensory study to let them to select the, the bitter regions. So after after first dimension separation. So we end up with a single isolated compounds and at a very high purity around about the 98%. So this pure compounds uh, is subsequently analysis by accurate, accurate the MS and MR technique for the structural elucidation. So the uh, identification is the last step of the sensor gather fractionation approach. And uh, this, uh, in this step, so I use the UPLC QTOP MS uh, to get the accuracy mass. Um, and also this instrument can provide the fragmentation information. So all this can provide us the elementary formula of the molecules and the general information of the molecule structures. And 1D and 2D MR are used to confirm the no bitter molecules and at the same time, and it also provides the useful information 
for structuring elucidation. So totally, uh, there are four beta compounds found in American hazelnut. So I will be talking about these compounds individually. So I will call them compound one, two, three, four because their chemical name kind of more complex and but I will be showing their name later. So compound one is identified based on the comparison of the commercial available standard. So these compounds belong to cyclic diraheptano and this is the secondary metabolite. And uh, MS, MS, MS spectra of the uh, compound one show the fragmentation ion at the 270. That is from the loss of the uh, uh, propanols by the cleavage of the linkage between the C8, C9, and B, as well as C11 and 12. So this compound has been found in European hazelnuts leaves, shells, and kernels. And the previous study reported a very similar structure associated with the bitter taste uh, in European hazelnut. So these compounds uh, uh, generate more uh, insect effect or germination nut. So based on our analytical data, so we believe so they misidentified mis their structure. So here is the character structure shown in this slide. And uh, we also found that these compounds uh, associated with the bitter taste in American hazelnut. So compound two is identified that use high resolution MS and MR data. So MS MS spectra of compound two show that the dominant ion 190, which is one of the IA bell degradation product and the production pathway of these compounds is that the IA is oxidized to yield the glucose glucoside the uh, derivative during the fruit development. So this compound has been reported in European hazelnuts, but not sure as the bitter uh, uh, taste. So in this study, so it's reported as the bitter molecules. So two bitter compounds are found in fraction 18. So the first one is the normal bitter compounds and the high resolution MS and in negative mode is 631.2024, which allow us to establish the chemical, uh, the molecule formula of the C13, H36, and O14. And the main fragment in MSMS allow us to establish the two main fragments ions. So first one is a three to five, is uh, corres uh, corres uh, correspond to dairy either haptanos, uh, and uh, the other, the second fragmentation ion and the 487 allow us to establish the glutaric, uh, glutaric acid moieties. So this compound is identified as uh, isolated dairy haptanos, and uh, to our best knowledge, so this compound isolates from the American hazelnut is the normal bitter molecules. So the second bitter compounds found in fraction 18 is aphazilins by comparison to commercial available standard. So this fragmentation patterns of aphazilin indicated a, a capphenol structure with a one glucoside. This compounds has been reported in some stem product and the first reported as bitter compounds in hazelnut. So totally the two, the diraheptanol compound one and the three, and the one alkaline compound two, and the flavonoids of glucoside compound four are identified as bitter compounds in American hazelnut. So we can see that compound one and the compound three present a com common diraheptanol backbones. And that might show a structure activities relationship for these classes of compounds. So these four bitter compounds were further evaluated their contribution to the bitter taste of in American hazelnut. To investigate their sensory impact, uh, um, we did the, some sensory study. So compound perception is based on how sensitive we human, the, the how sensitive human being. So in other words, so one bitter molecule can be detected as kind of parts per million and uh, others can be detected as a possible billing level. So to understand the human perception and how people perceive them, we, do, we did the threshold study. 
So in other words, in this study, so we calculated the concentration where people can perceive the bitter taste. So in this study, uh, panelists per uh, will present a series of the three athlete tests uh, contain the compounds of the study in ascending concentration paired with the uh, two water samples. So panelists are asked to pick the most bitter samples within the, uh, each sample size and stop the test when they correctly discriminated the test sample twice at the same concentration. So here is my American hazelnut data and also the bitter threshold value for these four bitter compounds. So you can see and there is the traumatic uh, variations on the panelists available uh, abilities to taste these samples. So it's uh, indicating the different the individuals, the sensitivities to these uh, bitter molecules. So here, so I only compare to see a marking a sample with our best estimated threshold value. So uh, we can see the concentration of the compound one in cell marking samples is lower than the, their best estimation threshold value. So which means this compounds is the key bitter compounds in this uh, American uh, hazelnut samples. So the now move to the compound two. So the concentration of the compound two is close to its best estimated best estimated the threshold value. So so this threshold uh, value is is try so our threshold study is to try to approximate the true threshold value. So it uh, generates a large confidence interval around the value calculated. So the best estimate threshold value of a compound two, even is higher, the, slightly higher than the, its concentration in nut. So it may still contribute to the bitterness. So the concentration of the uh, compound three in American hazelnuts are higher than than the bitter threshold value. So again, so we just now here try to compare the one well, say American can sample with our threshold value. So there are lots of parameters can be infected this value such as environment and the uh, uh, environment and the different varieties. So also there is a confidential interval, confidence uh, interval intervals around the value calculated. So we need to see if these compounds are higher or lower in a large sample size. So the concentration of the compound four in American hazelnuts are much higher than the bitter threshold value. So around the 10 times. So this compound is unexpected to contribute to the bitterness. And then in the end, the compound one, two, three, are close to, uh, close to the best estimate threshold and the more likely contribute to the bitterness. So it leads to the next step study. So to quantitative analysis of this target the bitter molecules in the 88, the hybrid hazelnut uh, samples. So in the study, the 88 the hybrid uh, American hazelnuts grow in the upper, uh, upper middle west of the United States were collected. And the quantitative analysis of these four bitter compounds across these 88 varieties are performed. So if we look at uh, uh, these varieties, we can see this is a large range of concentration across the, in these 88 samples. So indicating the influence of the genetic and the growing condition on the bitter compounds profile. So we can say for the 94% of the compound one, uh, above the reported the bitter threshold. So in other words, so the samples which concentration are below this threshold value are less perceived the bitterness. And um, the compound two, so even this compound has a close threshold value in the same American can sample. So here's the 75% uh, this 88 hybrid samples are above the reported bitter threshold. So indicating that this molecules is important to contribute to bitterness in hazelnut. So the move to the next compounds and the compound three. So we can see the 25% of this uh, uh, 88 varieties are above the reported bitter threshold, indicating this is also important as a bitter marker. So there are more samples at least in this table that presents the less bitter. So however, when we look at the compound four, 
So concentration of compound four in all hybrid hazelnut has a below the uh, structural value. So it means the compound four are not the main factors that contribute to the bitterness in this ATH hybrid cell. So all in all, and this all information indicated that the importance of the compound one, two, three to the bitterness, uh, uh, to the hazelnut bitterness. So to gain the more insight into the effect of the practice on bitter compounds level in the hazelnuts, so the four identify the bitter compounds were quantitative monitors and the four different drying processes. So, so one American hazelnut sample were collected and this sample underwent the four different drying treatments. So includes the dehusking ambient air drying. So air drying and the first air the different temperature. So in general, the compound one and the compound three were reported at the high concentration of the dehusking ambient air drying process. So it means the dehusk causes the, these compounds form. So it might be due to the fungi and after dehusk, it increases the possibilities to expose exposure to the fungi or other contamination. So the in general, so the low, lower concentration of the compound one and the compound three is expected to the contribute to a less bitter taste in hazelnuts and the perceived a more bad as a profile. So the concentration of the, the other two bitter compounds across this four drying treatment are not significantly different. So this study shows us the post-harvest handling practice play, uh, play a important role in the concentration, in the final concentration of the, these bitter compounds. So to summarize the main part of my presentation today, so after sample isolation and all series of the fragmentation and the 1D and the 2D MR. So we got the four bitter compounds in American hazelnuts. So after screening in a larger sample size and uh, uh, in a 88 uh, hybrid uh, samples. So we found the compound one, two, three are determined to be above the bitter threshold value for the for 94% and 70% and 25% of the in the 88 hybrid hazelnuts. And in the end, the, the hazelnut husk can be treated as a physical barrier. And that is, that is all my, that is all my today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We have about five minutes left, so. Oh. <laughs> so there are a couple of questions. Um, First, in a plant breeding program, we need to screen hundreds of plants if we want to make early decisions. How expensive and time consuming is determining the level of bitterness compounds for each plant? So because now we has already targeted the, this four bitter compounds is important for us. So if we do the, do the large quantitative analysis, one sample I think around maybe around the half hour to do the analysis, right? So yeah, this is, this yeah. is Devin as well. And just yeah. so <laughs> certainly screening chemical profiling <laughs> after the fact is, is um, a lot less intensive. And so um, I guess what I would suggest or say is you could probably do hundreds of samples, you know, and in, in a short period, like a month or so, if you had your method set up and, and um, you know, away we would go. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question is, does roasting always remove the bitter compounds? So, so in our, so in the study, so we only target for the, the raw nut, but so I think based on the drawing treatment, so we found that this, the two compounds, they are influential by the temperature. So I think they can remove some, they can reduce some concentration. But I, it's possibly, yeah. It's still, I yeah. would say that, um, again, just to add some thoughts on that, that uh, <laughs> we have two more students that are working in this area, right, yeah. as you know, and so they will be focusing more on, on those aspects. I think some of, of Sue's data had sort of pointed to that there is some mm -hmm. potential effects, um, but based on, on uh, kind of Sue laying the foundation, now I think we can sort of explore those questions uh, in a hopefully much more rapid way. Okay. So I guess the question is to be determined. 
<laughs> Thank you. So uh, third question, did the panelists who perceived only a low level on one of the compounds, were they also able to perceive other compounds at low levels? Are mm. there universal tasters or were tasters mixed in with, with compounds they could sense? Or were tasters mixed in with, with compounds they could sense? So, so I think it's uh, based on the, the people's sensitivities and the, the people they receive, they can get detected the one compound at the low level. It definitely means they can detect the other compound at the low level. So it's a totally genetic, kind of the genetic. I think it's the uh, very, variabilities is uh, depend on the people's sensitive to the each compounds. So mm -hmm. we cannot say, yeah. And uh, so next yeah, Sue is, yeah. Sue is right on that. It, yeah, we, we generally train our panel to get alignment uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, just like a detector, you would sort of normalize. Uh, so we, we sort of screen for people, uh, at least that are um, able to detect better reliably, I guess is maybe a, a thought. Right. They certainly range in their sensitivities, but they, uh, in some sensor methods, uh, are then scaled. And so they kind of know that if they rate it as a two. They're all understanding what that means. Um, so hopefully that adds some thoughts or some okay. clarification to that question. Okay. I think that's it for the questions. Yeah. So thank you very much, Thanks. Sue, and um, congratulations on completing your PhD. Thanks. Sue, Sue is off to a new job in the next couple of weeks, so she's yeah. excited. And what is that? Oh, it's a... Uh, uh, it's I still do the analytical work. Yeah. Okay. It's in the pharma so pharmaceutical yeah. company. So anyways. <laughs> so not food science. You're right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, congratulations. Thanks. And, and just to clarify on the slides that the varieties that were listed, obviously I think was intuitive, but they're the ones that were below threshold just to provide some insight for the readers and people that are thinking about, you know, um, let's say flavor um, uh, breeding enhancement, right? So. Okay, thanks. Good. You want to share your screen, Mark? I was trying to, and it said it wouldn't let me. All right. Come on. You know, I do Zoom quite often, and I think I'd just jump right in on this, and it would be perfect. <clears throat> All right. Has it done it yet? No. Oh. Did you click the green share well, screen button at the bottom? Yep. And then it, it made yep, you here we go. go. Got it. There we go. Now All you're right. good. I'll, uh, I'll jump right in without too much intro because I got a lot of material to cover and I'm going to cover it fast. Um, industrial large scale agriculture has based its entire strategy on individual performance of high yield rather than overall population fitness. And this has resulted in millions of acres of genetic monocultures that require enormous inputs, irrigation, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and more. And as time has gone on, growers are getting uh, less of a bang for their buck for whatever their inputs are. And this, this is an exercise in, in uh, diminishing returns uh, like you wouldn't believe. And with almost no genetic depth or diversity, there are millions of acres of, of woody crops all kinds of crops nationwide that are critically at risk from novel diseases that are happening. It's happening right now with the Oregon hazelnut industry that uh, only has a handful of genetic clones uh, and its susceptibility to Eastern filbert blight. And what's, what's being encouraged over and over again is we're being told by all these experts and is, I don't want to, I don't want to diss all of the important research that experts are doing, but growers, farmers are being encouraged to plant 
huge monocultures of single variety uh, plants. And I got two examples right here on the bottom. These are hazelnuts in Oregon. And at the top, this is, uh, these are apples, pears in, um, in the um, Chelan region of, of Washington state where you've got high intensity uh, growing. And th these, are, these are places that have individual cultivars that produce super high yields. Therefore, if you plant all, you'll be financially viable. Why are they going out of business? Because they're totally susceptible to pests and diseases. And why are they having to put things under greenhouses in high intensity? They're trying to keep pests out. What happens when the power goes down? What happens when a hailstorm wipes out your plastic? This is a very fragile and a, and a very dangerous way to base our food system. And what's really fascinating about the whole thing is why is it that most American farmers are losing money, period, across the board? Probably if there are any farmers of you in the audience here, you're not making a lot of money on the farm. That's just the way things are in the USA. And I don't think that it's your fault. I think what it is, is there is a system of agriculture that's being promoted that's flawed is that we can find individual top performers, put them all by themselves, make them line up like soldiers, and they will behave themselves and produce for us and make zillions and zillions of dollars per acre, and then everyone will be happy. That's not how nature rolls, and that's not how we roll at Forest Agriculture Nursery. So for over 25 years, Forest Agriculture Nursery has been selectively breeding hazelnuts on the actual planet as it actually is using mass selection plant breeding techniques for both population fitness and individual performance simultaneously. I had the uh, interesting coincidence, coincidence uh, to, of growing up on the top of a hill in Lancaster, Massachusetts, on the north side of the hill on the bottom of the valley. This guy was born, John Chapman, also known as Johnny Appleseed. Johnny Appleseed is responsible for the majority of apple varieties in North America. He took seeds, seedling, made seedling plants from uh, cider uh, orchards and planted seeds everywhere from uh, the Virginia all the way over to Tennessee, Illinois. Uh, he was responsible for the single largest flourishing of varieties in apple genetics in, uh, in North American history. The other side of the hill, this guy was born, Luther Burbank. Luther Burbank is the single individual human that has more plant varieties to his name, named plant varieties to his name than any other human being on earth. Both Johnny Appleseed and Luther Burbank did this before we even knew what inheritance was, before we knew what chromosomes were, and way before we knew what alleles were. Uh, and they did it, and Luther Burbank pioneered the method and made it famous called mass selection breeding. With mass selection breeding, you basically select your base population, you collect genetics from a wide range of, of locations, you put them all in one place and let them cross pollinate, you select desirable plants from that base population. Of the, uh, of the nurseries here, so far only Z's Nutty Ridge is coming close to this and they selected a base population and they've selected a few plants out of that desirable base population. Well at Forest Ag, we then mix their offspring and we raise the next generation and the next generation and we repopulate the uh, seed orchard with promising cultivars or superior um, offspring. We evaluate them in field trials and then we select superior individuals to be re released as varieties. How do we select the desirable plants? Um, those of you who are here yesterday um, when the soils guy was talking about uh, all of the prunings that this one grower was taking off the field, burning. Now they're saying, oh, let's take the prunings off the field, burn them, then bring them back and spread it. Well, why not chip them right in place? We chip a lot of plants right in place. Have been for years. We remove the undesirable plants. We probably killed more hazelnut plants than you'll ever even put in the ground. Our original base population came from a wide range of sites, all the way from uh, wild hazels in Maine. We got uh, hazelnuts from Grimo in Ontario, Cecil Ferris in Michigan, Badger Set in Minnesota. We got uh, wild hazels from uh, Lawyer Nursery in Montana, and we got Oregon uh, hazelnuts, and we got uh, some what they called philasals from breeding work up in Alberta. We combined them to our in our location in southwest. 
Wisconsin, and then began ruthlessly selecting for the ones that would survive. Our plants are not sissies that are expensively grown with perfect weed control, perfect irrigation, and perfect amounts of fertilizer. They're grown, bred, and selected for cold hardiness, early reproduction, disease resistance, and high yields in the real world with heavy competition and all kinds of weather with less than perfect care. Uh, because no matter how, how well we want to take care of our plants, life happens, and oftentimes things get treated a little bit less than, uh, than perfectly, and that shouldn't cost us the farm. And our plants have been grown in integrated agroforestry systems for a higher total site yield. This may actually mean a, a reduction, a little bit lower yields in each individual component, and I'll explain a little bit here. Agroforesters speak of a concept called the land equivalent ratio. One of the foundational studies of this in North America was done by Kevin Wolves, the founder of the Savannah Institute, where he, he compared corn and beans separately uh, with corn and beans grown in conjunction with walnut. The land equivalent ratio basically says that if you have a one acre of corn, you'll get maximum yields of corn. One acre of walnut, you'll get maximum yields of walnut. If you have a combined system, you'll have lower yields of corn and lower yields of walnut, but the total corn plus walnuts is more than if you grew two separate acres of, of one of each. So in this system here, we have lower yields of, of acorn squash and lower yields of hazelnut for a total higher site yield combined. Here we have lower yields of beef per acre and lower yields of hazelnut per acre for a combined total greater yield than either separately. Here we have uh, combined yields uh, that are greater than individual yields of either poultry or hazelnuts. And in the case with both cattle and poultry, we're getting fertilizer as a, as a side effect. And with the poultry, we're getting insect control uh, as, as an additional side effect, additional benefit in the system. And then of course, my buddies right here, I put hogs in the orchard. Instead of waiting for the research to come out to tell me how small of amount I should grind up and put into a feed that sounds like work to me, I turn the pigs loose and let them go harvest their own. I don't want them to destroy the orchard. So if you look at their nose, they've got a ring in their nose. They've got two of them. Um, and these, these are my favorite hazelnut harvesters, my hazelnut recyclers, because uh, pork chops taste great. We also farm the decay cycle, back to these chipping um, images. When we have plants that don't meet our specifications, we cut them down, we chip them up. This is the a, uh, uh, orchard mower on the lower left. It's a Berti, B-E-R-T-I from Italy, has heavy duty hammers. Um, and we use it, we can chip material up to two inches in diameter. Well, what decays wood chips? What decays branches? Fungus do. So why not put fungus into our system that we can actually harvest and sell as an additional yield? So wait, that would be, you know, acorn squash and cattle and hogs and chickens and fungus. Oh, right. And hazelnuts. And if anybody ever tells you that, that shiitake mushrooms uh, don't naturalize in systems. They've never been to my property in Southwest Wisconsin. These are naturalized shiitake mushrooms that live in, in our system. Now, harvesting, yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's laborious by hand. Myself, personally, when I'm harvesting my own hazelnuts, I'm motivated and I move real fast. I can do about 20 bushels a day. Uh, if I'm paying somebody 10 bucks an hour to go harvest hazels, do you really think they're moving as fast as me? No. However, if I have some folks paying for a weekend on an Airbnb, they get a wonderful meal, a beautiful place to stay. They come out and they pick hazelnuts and they can take home all the hazelnuts that they want for free. I don't even charge them for it. Well, how can you make any money when they're, they're, you're selling hazelnuts for nothing? Well, because they're harvesting the ones that I then sell or plant into trees. And when you have little piggies that are as tame as puppy dogs and will come right up to you and join you, uh, it's a wonderful experience for people. So alley crops plus hazelnuts and cattle and pigs and chickens and mushrooms and tourists, friends, customers, free harvest. Uh, now we have to only plant cultivars. Do you want to grow underneath plastic or on pure sand or have these bushes that want to that want to be bushes and train them to grow into trees? It sounds like too much work to me. All right, hazelnuts. You've probably seen the slide. I think Jason probably showed it. This one right here, rosy, is one of the, um, the hazelnuts, the, the plants that was generated in our breeding work, our selection process on the farm. 
Forest Agriculture Nursery is the only nursery that's been participating with UNHDI for over a decade. And seven of these 17 plants are the results of our breeding network. Jason likes to show those first top 10. Isn't that cool? These are great. Well, these are the high individual performers. They're not even available for sale. Well, the controlled crosses, they're available for now. Next seven down, consistent, uniformity, big yields. Here's the plants that we have available for spring in 2021. Our selected seedlings um, are the workhorses. It's a wide genetic diversity for optimal pollinizing. They will pollinate with each other. They will grow in uh, USDA growing zone four. We actually have uh, some plants that are growing up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, these are the workhorses of our system. Uh, these next slides are gonna pop through real quick because it's a little bit difficult to read, but some data that Jason had collected through time shows how our breeding process has been working over the past few years. The uh, yellow line has an average in-shell nut size of around 13 millimeter. This was planted in 2000. Well, as the years go by, we remove uh, lower yielding plants, smaller diameter plants. The nut yields and the average number of nuts above 13 go up. The orange line um, shows plants that were planted in 2011. And then the blue line here are plants that were planted in 2012. This process is working, it's verified. Uh, the other plants that we have are the controlled cross seedlings. This is where we vegetatively propagated one parent and another parent, put them in an isolation block, let them cross. We figured out which of the two produced superior plants and immediately put them into variety trials under supervision um, by Jason Fishbach. We're the only uh, nursery that has, has done this. We've been collaborating for over a decade. No other hazelnut nursery stock, stock has been through this much scrutiny. These are the racehorses. 80% uh, of the controlled crosses bear uh, nuts within two years. Now that doesn't mean that you're gonna get supersonic yields in two years. It means you're gonna get onesie twosie on a whole bunch of the plants. And if you went down a row and tried to pick a hundred foot row, you get like a cup of nuts. It's not really worth the harvest just like any other heart, uh, hazelnuts, four to five years before they really start to kick in and uh, produce harvestable quantities. 85% of the plants uh, have a bush type architecture, uh, which is really helpful for the straddle harvesting. And then what I like most about the, about the controlled crosses is the fact that they, they are ripe within a week and a half window. As soon as those controlled crosses are ripe, we hit them, we hit them hard and heavy, we strip all the nuts off and we're done real quick with them. That really uh, simplifies uh, harvesting. Some of Jason's research has showed that uh, per acre yields on the controlled crosses are slightly lower than um, the seedlings, but the uniformity I think more than makes up for it. Uh, they have a proven track record, their uniform plant form, uh, nut size, yield is all strong. And they're available now and they will grow in your growing zone. They're growing everywhere from Oklahoma all the way up to central Canada. Now, because of people's obsession with having a cultivar that produces way huge nuts or way more nuts than anybody else, we also are doing vegetatively propagated cultivars. We have three that uh, we're currently working with um, on a regular basis, Rosie, Yahtzee, and Larson. And if you wanna order some of these, they're, they're available. Uh, they won't be ready uh, to plant until 2022. It just takes time to generate uh, those from cuttings. Down below, you see the size. This is a, um, that's a rosy. And this is one of my rosy propagation beds in the center. And on the lower right is our one gallon pots of uh, rosy cultivars being planted out into a grower's planting. This shows you a little bit about the nut size and nut quality. The, um, the pellicle that firmly adheres to uh, Yahtzee, um, I'm not sure if that comes off with blanching. We haven't done many tests on it, but both Ro Rosie and Larson are very clean nuts. Now, what I started to talk about in the very beginning of this uh, presentation was how you know, American agriculture has gotten fixated on having a very reduced uh, family lines of genetics and that, that creates huge flaws. And this, I'm gonna point it out because it's already happening in the hazelnut world. Rosie and Larson are direct descendants of a badger set GO29N. 
Nitka, grown by Z's Nutty Ridge, is a direct descendant of GO29N. So here's two or three uh, potential cultivars that are all, they're brothers, they're brothers and sisters. Well, then Yahtzee is from a badger set G008 once upon a time. G008 and GO29 in Minnesota are only 20 feet away. It's possible they pollinated one another. So here we've got four different cultivars that quite likely are brothers and sisters. That's a very narrow, a very uh, delicate, and it's a risky position to be in. We need to be using more seedlings in our plantings. Now, the best time to have planted hazelnuts was 20 years ago. You order now at forestag.com and you can plant this spring. Now, my perspective on cultivars versus seedlings, uh, a couple different people have mentioned to go ahead and plant your seedlings as pollinizer plants, um, plant some, one every fifth row or so, and then plant cultivars in between. I'd flip that around. Let's plant our, our seedlings uh, as the majority and then fill in with some heavy producers every once in a while, because in the meantime, let's be growing crops in between our rows of hazels. Let's be raising livestock in our rows between hazels, etc. So here's our contact information at Forest Agriculture Nursery. Uh, and I too have written a couple of different books. And if you would like to learn how to grow like nature does, come on and learn with us and use this link up above restoringagriculture.com and you can register for our online courses and trainings. What I have uh, for my quickie little nursery intro today. Thank you for, for hosting me here, all of you organizers. I can't hear anybody. You have to put your microphone on, Lois. <laughs> I thought I did. Plug in that All right, Linda, well, is that the end of the presentation? I don't see any questions and- uh, Yeah, I didn't see any questions either. So I, I, this ends our session for today. Thank you, Mark, for um, um, presenting. That was um, very interesting. Um, we only had one uh, nursery today because the research topics were scheduled longer than the other days. So- Thank you, uh, Linda, bye-bye. All right, thanks. Well, hold on, there, there is a question if you're still there and able to answer it. I'm still here. There you are. Okay, what's the best way to start your seedlings? Put the roots in the ground. We, <laughs> ship, we ship between uh, April 15th and the end of May. And uh, of course, the better the site is prepared, um, follow some of the recommendations of the Midwest BioAg fellow, um, you know, neutral to slightly acid pH, the best weed control you have, things will grow better. You have a higher success rate. And then if it's dry at all during your establishment year, have some tea tape for backup irrigation if necessary. Uh, we've In the upper Midwest, we've never had to irrigate um, more than two or three times in the 25 years that we've been at it. And as far as mechanical harvesting, we haven't mechanically harvested yet. Um, you know, I've been collaborating with, with Dave Bonhoff and Jason and all that. Um, What's interesting is there are harvesters on the far western part of the state and there's harvesters in Madison and they keep coming in various different directions and I happen to be like right in the middle and uh, I haven't uh, had the mechanical harvester on it yet. I would love to have Big Blue uh, come and give a ride over our, uh, over our plantings. That would be great. All right, thank you, Mark. Whoops, it looks like maybe one other question. Nope. Okay, um, don't forget that if you did not register for tomorrow, be sure to go do that so you get the correct Zoom link. Otherwise, we'll see the rest of you tomorrow morning at 8.30. We're gonna start off with Mike Lilja at 8.30 talking about the American Hazelnut Company. So we'll see you then, have a good afternoon.